Um, and I think you're you're going to be uh, loud enough. Oh, yeah. uh, how's my hair? Perfect. You Everything's need a hair and makeup great. girl. You don't have one. We don't have one. Um, we can't afford that. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, we can. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that shit before. <laughs> We're doing. We actually could, but you know, I mean, when you go over what you pay, I know, them, I know, it's I too know, much. I know, I know, and and you just get used when you're really bootstrapping. Yeah, you get used to not fucking wasting fucking money. That's right. the whole thing, and I I know so many people who actually spend more money to feel more legitimate. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's called in the startup industry. That's called playing house, um, I and like it's that. everyone, including us, does it with the first money they get. Right. Um. So and um, they go, let me feel. Let's feel more legitimate. Right. Yeah. Because we're spending the money. Exactly. All right. Let's get this. We're in. We're in. We're, we're in. in. We don't tell you when we're in. Oh, we don't. We oh. just go in. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. It's so we are that in. Way. So I can. So I. So I can tell my acid story. I'd love to hear it. All right. Let's hear. It. Let's, Curtis Yarvin is with us. Google that's him. A brilliant. That's a brilliant trick. Um. And um. All right. So um. You know, uh, Tim wanted me to uh, humanize myself a little bit. Yes, because, uh, with drugs. It's good to be human. Um, and so one of the best ways, um, you know, to humanize yourself, besides wearing an authentic Shea shirt, this is actually made in Cuba, by the way. It was given to me by my friend Sam Frank, who visited that country. So I love uh, that. I can't prove it, but I believe you. It is absolutely true. Amazing. I, well, you can inspect the label later. But um, <laughs> the, um, anyway, so... Um, um, Acid. So I guess my acid story is from uh, 1997. Do you remember? And where were you in 1997, Tim? I was 12, but also starting to do my first acid uh, wow. drop was 13. Wow. Okay, so that's was, very yeah. early. So so I was I was um, just to set the stage. Um, I was precocious in a number of things, and um, I actually skipped three grades before high school. I grew up as a foreign service brat, and when between when I was 10 and 11. Um, I was three grades ahead in uh, the English school, Nicosia, Cyprus, which was a little British public school where we wore uniforms and had houses just like in Harry Potter. I love that. Um, and um, um, should I look at the camera? Or no. You? Okay. Just okay. Um, and um, then my parents, as diplomats do, moved back to Washington and I was sent to Wild Lake High School in Columbia, Maryland, um, a, a distant suburb of DC, as a 12 year old sophomore. So um, basically, <laughs> I've, you know, I've just. So you were a 12 year old. A 12 year old sophomore it's in a public yeah. school in Maryland. Did so, the kids think that was cool or did they hate you? Well, I think the thing is that would, you know, for when that's an excellent question. And I think that basically. You know, um, that was in my head. I'm like, which movie is exactly it? which yeah. movie is it? Right. And, right. and so, you know, when you look back at that, you, you basically, you know, if you're in that role, kids and, you know, I hope young people aren't watching this because we're about to talk about drugs. But yes. um, the um, and worse politics. and worse and worse politics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just the segue. Right. Yeah. You know, um, um, you know, nobody really cares about acid. But, you know, what right. we get into after that, <laughs> you know, that's the real trip. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's not DMT either. Right. Right. right, right. You know, but um in any case, um, it really depends on the behavior of the kid and right. how he sort of behaves in the context of the people around him. Um, if he's just like really sweet and funny, it's one kind of movie. But if he's a little arrogant asshole, it's going to be the other. And which one were you? It was the other. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. in any case, um, um, you know, that led me going to college. I went to Johns Hopkins because that's where they had um, CTY, which now since this summer will be known as the Fire Festival of Nerd Camps. But we yeah. won't get into that catastrophe. Is uh, that when, you, when you're young... Uh, person and you're going to learn and you get like good test scores they right. do like advanced you know you'll sit you'll do like algebra in like a week and a half by sitting and doing algebra all day for like six hours gotcha. by yourself right. by your fucking self there right you go. so this is this is like you know this is like intellectual like fucking boot camp uh, my daughter was supposed to go to it, but it got canceled two days before the event this year. Thank you, Johns Hopkins. Anyway, so I went to Johns Hopkins as a freshman because it was there. Um, you know, no respect to Johns Hopkins, but um, it sucked. So I right. transferred to Brown. So I graduated from Brown in 92. And then I went to grad school in computer science at Berkeley. And I lasted for about a year and a half at Berkeley before I decided that academia sucks, even in computer science, and it's a lot right. worse elsewhere. Um, it was just a bad run of systems professors at Berkeley, too. So anyway, I was like, I dr I'm going to drop out and like seek my fortune in the new multimedia boom, the multimedia bubble of the early 90s, which 
CD-ROMs, 500 yeah. channels. Like, you know, you experienced this as retro, but yes. for me, it was real. Right, um, right. And I lived it, right? You know, and in any case, basically, I got a job in that bubble. And, um, and then I also basically got into the early so the early internet in its in its capacity, which is a you talk about, network. which is amazing, because you talk about it was like decentralized. It was a decentralized social network. It actually worked. It had no central government. It was not censored. It fucking worked. It was called Usenet. That's right. Um, and you know, let me. You know, I, we're gonna get. You know, I know everyone wants to get to the acid, but let's talk about Usenet for a second. Yeah, please. Um. So um um, Usenet was actually it was a decentralized social network that worked it was utterly amazing it was like if reddit was decentralized and had an ontology which means like an actual map of its content rather than like and it had like a democratic governance structure it was republic it was not a dictatorship like reddit. right um and it was utterly amazing and here was the problem with usenet basically we were on this thing Nobody knew about it. I remember the first time I read about the internet in the New York Times. It was like seeing your cousin in the New York Times. It was 1988. And it was about a worm that was on the internet. It was just like, wow, the New York Times is writing about the internet. Right. So right. Usenet basically, the reason that Usenet worked, we all thought was that because it was a decentralized social network and the future of humanity. That's what we all just naturally assumed is that Believed. we were part new. We knew it. Right. We didn't believe it. We knew it. Right. It turned out that actually what made Usenet special was that to get onto Usenet, you had to be a college student or work at a tech company. Interesting. <laughs> and so you didn't, it wasn't. It was, it was um, yes. Right. It wasn't everybody. It wasn't everybody. Right. It was basically, you know, it had, it had a quality filter, which was a human filter, which was an elitist filter. Right. You know, it's like if you go to Burning Man, have you been to Burning Man? I haven't. You haven't. I haven't either. I, yeah. You know, someone very. I feel like I want to go, but I'm sober. And I feel like, is that, you know, I, I've always talked in this, uh, sh uh, on the show about like missing something in life and then not being able to go back to it. Yeah. Like being able That's to be like, thing. you know, you know, there, some very sick adults wanted to like replicate summer camp because they had never gone. And, sure. da -da 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 -da. and you go, this is, you look at it and you go, this is, it, it makes me feel physically ill. I don't know if being a sober guy at Burning Man is it a good thing or is it, am I trying to recapture something? That, I, I yeah. really, I really, you know, I couldn't tell you, um, I'm a widower. My yeah. wife had gone to Burning Man a couple of times. I never have. My, and my fiance is a burner. Oh, and okay. so basically this gives me, you know, certain, you know, we're, we'll get back, we'll get back to the acid trip. I, yes. you know, I promise. But it's interesting to compare Burning Man as a community to Usenet as a community, because both of them have a sense that in certain senses, they're superior to everything else in the world. Right. And in certain senses, they are superior to everything else in the world. In other senses, like if you look at, for example, the total fertility rate of burners, you're going to find a very low number. Right. And, um, and so, you know, or, you know, that sort of a community that exists by sort of almost that reproduces itself that lasts over time because Burning Man is not super young that sort of reproduces itself by intake rather than by fertility. Right. There's something slightly imperfect about that. And both communities have a barrier to entry. And the barrier to entry. So the yes. barrier to entry is what I was about to talk about. It's basically the barrier to entry, you know, that sort of creates a filter. You know, I was talking to, you know, I'm going to protect his name, an intellectual, uh, you know, who knows the Burning Man organizers well. Uh, and I was asking him. Steve sort of, Bannett. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, Steve is that. Steve runs. Steve runs. Uh, never mind. Uh, you know, but Steve, uh, you know, Steve yeah. actually found, uh, you know, but, um, uh, sorry, uh, you know, but um, the, um, 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 Talking to the guy at Burning Man. Yeah, talking to the guy at Burning Man. And I'm like, why does Burning Man have, you know, if you go to Burning Man, to me, from what I've heard of Burning Man, not being a burner, not wanting to embarrass myself, but I think that what makes Burning Man special is the feeling that everyone at Burning Man has that anyone you meet there will be like an old friend you haven't met yet. Right. And, you know, and that's an incredible feeling in a community. And that's an and attitude, right? That's an attitude. Right. That's a, that's an ethos. Right. You know, there's all this public ethos that sort of comes with, you know, the 12 principles of Burning Man. Yes. One of which is, is radical inclusion. Everyone right. is welcome. Is you know, that similar? And, would you say Bohemian Grove is the same thing? 
You know, yes, and Bohemian was, Grove right. has a much more explicit barrier to entry. Anyway, right. I'm, ta I'm talking to this guy, yeah. you know, very, very, very intelligent, interesting individual. And I'm basically like, what, it, what is it about Burning Man that causes, you know, this feeling of togetherness, right? And, you know, he's like, well, you know, we don't use money. You know, there's a number of principles of Burning Man, you know. And I'm like, you know, well, basically my perspective is the reason that this is the case is that pretty much everyone at Burning Man is like pretty much everyone else is at Burning Man as a person. Moreover, what accomplishes this is a principle that you might call radical exclusion, which is that it really sucks to get to Burning Man. It's really hard to be at Burning Man. You're basically punishing yourself you know, this fucking playa is like hell. Right. And you're punishing yourself to get there. It's hard to get a ticket. It's hard to find a camp. It's basically, it is, as you say, essentially the same thing as Bohemian Grove. It's, it has a slightly different community. Actually, Bohemian Grove, I was just hearing someone who's uh, talking to someone who's, I guess he's a guest at Bohemian Grove because his father is a member. Bohemian Grove basically actually started out as literally Bohemian. Originally, it was like an artsy fartsy club, very much like Burning Man. And right. that served a similar, you know, kind of community people who would have found Bohemians who would have found themselves very, very welcome and found like felt really completely right at Burning Man. Um, and so in both of these cases, what's creating the um, the feeling, just this incredible social feeling of togetherness is like a policy, an effective policy of radical exclusion. Right. And when this policy breaks down, as it did in the Internet in the event that is known as Eternal September, um, it's called Eternal September because in, every year in September, a bunch of clueless newbies, a, a lot of Internet slang like newbie was invented on Usenet, um, a lot of clueless Internet newbies who were freshmen would descend. Right. And then AOL that sent the little disks in the mail or yeah. remember that AOL basically gave all AOL users access to Usenet, which was basically sort of, you know, as if you let, you know, the entire 25 million population of Lagos, Nigeria into Brooklyn. Right. Right. And so, so then what happens to Usenet after what happens yeah. to Usenet is that it simply becomes <clears throat> unusable without right. uh, without being an aristocracy that's without right. being elitist without basically it's passive filter it's just unlivable and um you know what what precedes its death and and this is sort of only a symptom in a way some people think this caused it is basically it started developing binaries news groups in which people used usenet to trade like wares and so that got everyone's you know like the result was that all isps basically pulled usenet access right. anyway it imploded and it died and it was basically because it was essentially a high trust network um, and, you know, I don't know if you know the work of Robert Putnam, uh, you know, he's a sociology Slightly, at yes, Harvard, yeah. right? So, you know, he did this famous thing called Bowling Alone in which he examined yes. the decline of high trust social it's a, networks. It's a great book. He follows it up with, <laughs> I forget the title of his, it may have just been a paper. He yeah. does this paper in which he found that basically the more variety it is, and I'm using that word very intentionally, the more variety there is in a community, the lower trust it is. And so if you have like Chinatown where it's basically all Chinese people, right. there's a lot of trust, you know, um, you know, and as why, soon as- Why is that looked at today as something that's bad? Uh, because variety is a synonym for diversity. Okay. And see, when I always look at it, I, I grew up in Long Island and-, and Long Island. Long Island. And my, my grandparents were from Great Neck. So, okay. you know, yeah. 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 Now, and, and that's a great point, right? So Great Neck, you have- Persian restaurants and a lot of Sephardic Jews that live there. And right. in other towns, you would have Irish and Italian people. Right. And nobody, <clears throat> there was, of course, Long Island was racist and people made jokes and whatever. Right. But there was no violence. Right. There was absolutely, there were no riots. There's no Persian on Italian riots. No. Like the Italians there, don't take it up with the Persians. There was none of that. Like the Buddhists yeah. and the Tamils right. in Sri Lanka. No, right. You know, yeah. Yeah, there was no like, you know, there was no West Side Story happening. Right. So to me, I always go, you have different groups of people that choose to live within some in-group preference, mm -hmm. right? Right. And they they can date other groups. They why is that? Why is that a bad thing? I think it depends on whether, in certain cases, um, you might sort of develop a function where you say, okay, if you examine the kind of conventional narrative that, for example. Everyone 
at least pretends to believe on their college application essay. Right. That's sort of a nice randomization because who is the admissions officer? We don't know. Right. But we're pretty sure of what they believe. Right. And you'll notice that this person, basically that feeling of in-groupness, what um, the great Arab historian Ibn Khaldun called Asabiya, the feeling of, you know, it's us against the world. There's this old Somali proverb, actually right. a number of countries claim it, you know, me, me and my country against the world, me and my clan yeah. um, against my country, me and my tribe against my I clan. I have that tattooed on my <laughs> lower back. <It's> a, <laughs> I have, All right. I'm, I have a tramp stamp of that Somali. Uh, holy shit. And of Sorry. course it ends with me against my brother, yes, right? Yeah. You know, right. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, that's a little, uh, you know, yeah. that's a little Somali, but you know, that's like, that's not exclusive to yeah. like Somali. I by many many yeah. countries claim that yeah. that proverb in a way. So what you'll notice is, for example, imagine you were in a world. You know, let's take the like nascent Persian I Italian. Is that wrestler I Italian? Can I say I Italian? No, no, like Italians a, we abuse on this show constantly. Okay, awesome, awesome, yes. awesome. Actually, can I tell you a joke relating yes, to that? Absolutely. Um, are you familiar with the work of Garibaldi? A slightly, like not you know, not have intimately. You, and have you ever been to Italy? I've never been yet. Which part, where in Italy would you like to go? If you want I'd to Italy? love to go to Rome. You'd love to go to Rome. That's right. Well, Rome. Yeah, Rome is around the middle of Italy. Yes. So, um, you know, Garibaldi, of course, uh, you know, um, I, well, I, you know, you probably, that's, I can't really tell the joke if you don't know the story of Garibaldi. But well, if, in case you do, okay. in case you do, um, there's something very, that they say about Garibaldi in parts yeah. of Italy, um, but only parts of Italy. Yeah. Uh, I think they say it in Rome. Um, which is that Garibaldi didn't unify Italy. He divided Africa. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, no, sure. So, I, so, I mean, there's yeah. Italians and there's Italians. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, so so let's let's take, for example, right. let's take, for example, um, suppose you have two groups in a society. You have um, Persians and I Italians. I don't know any racial slurs for Persians, but I know they're there. Um, just, um, do, can we, what about... What about Dune Coon? <laughs> Let's just say Persian. Okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> our friend's Persian, and we're uh, calling that. But go on. All right. Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, Are we still on YouTube? Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Right. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's, I mean. <laughs> right. We're fine. Uh, you know, frankly, we're I'm not even sure that's We've accurate. we got a fun audience. I'm not even sure that's accurate. It may but, not you know, be. Uh, you know, in any case, it's yeah. not usually what I think of when it when Right. It, of course. Right. You know, um, um, uh, um, the, I mean. Rugs. I mean, anyway, yes, rugs. <laughs> rugs. Okay. more rugs than dunes, I think. Okay. But um, um, the um, let's not go there. Anyway, we've right. got Persians and I Italians, and um, let's examine basically one of the ways we can understand there is a potential conflict between any two groups with in group status. So you know, as the great German uh, political philosopher Carl Schmitt once said, the essential political distinction is that between friend and enemy. So to a Persian, all Persians are friends. To an I Italian, all Itali Italians, north or south, are friends. Okay, right. now within the I Italian community, it's like the proverb, sure. right? But you know, the thing is when I Italians think about Persians, basically they just, you know, they don't, they don't even think about them. Right. Um, you know, actually I think it's the other way. Right? But you know, sure. in any case, basically, so there's a couple of things you can say about this. First and foremost, basically, one of the questions you can ask about the narrative is, does the narrative pr promote Asabia among Persians or I Italians? Are I Italians, for example, taught in the schools to think, you know, all I Italians must act together right. you know, ever since the Persian attacks, in fact, on Rome? You may recall, did you know that there was a Roman emperor that was captured by the Persians? And then, you know, I forget, um, later Roman Empire, he's captured by the Persians and he's basically used as a footstool for the Persian emperor to mount his fucking horse. Amazing. Amazing. And when he dies, like his skin is stuffed with straw and preserved. Right. They don't, didn't last to the, this right. day. A lot, of, a lot of things are going on. But, you know, yeah. but in any case, you know, so this is what assholes these fucking Persians are. Right. Right. You know, and so if you go over to the Persians, then, you know, so you have all these stories in there's sort of a group litigation. It's like the basically the I Italians have this brief against Valerian. It was Valerian. The I Italians have a grief. Thank you. Jesus Christ. Uh, um, good, um, the I Italians have a brief um, against the Persians. Right. They've been victimized 
by the Persians since the days of Valerian, who was just not treated like it's, it's war crime. Right. Look at that shit. Right. Crime, you know, yeah. right. A war crime. Right. You know, and the thing is, that's like typical, you know, frankly, that's typical Persian behavior. Right. right? You know, whereas the Italians, of course, founded fucking civilization. Right. You right. know, and so then you go over to the Persian side and, you know, do they have a brief against the Italians or does the narrative teach them to be like, you know, we Persians, you know, came down from the hills in the time of Darius, you know, and like basically the Italians have been calling us names, you know, right. and sort of all of this stuff. And like we never set out to attack Rome, you know, like, yes, Valerian himself war criminal. Right. Right. You know, and so what's the narrative there? Whereas basically and the thing is from sort of a kind of natural pattern of human history, the narrative there that you would expect, that's the narrative you would expect. Right. And if instead the narrative among the Persians is, you know, we Persians, you know, we've been committing wrongs for many years. You know, we founded an empire. Who do you think we conquered to found right. that empire? Right. Who, who became our slaves? You know, look at what we did with the Jews. We did something with the Jews, right? right. You know, not good, right? You know, that's right. in the Bible, but right. it's true, right? You yeah. know, and you're basically like, you know, like we Persians ourselves, you know, we're like modern Germans. Like so the, we, so we have the, to take it. Yeah. We, we have to be accountable for our actions over the centuries. It's like the thing of two different movies, you said. Right. Right. So the thing is, basically, once you imagine one of these movies, you can imagine sort of the other movie. And then your basic question is like what you're looking at here here sort of in one case or another is um what the um the great italian political scientist gaetano mosca um who's best accessed in the machiavellians by james burnham a book i've been promoting for like 10 years great book. um great have you read that i've read that it's yes. fucking awesome yeah the first like you know like imagine it's like first chapter you're learning yeah. boxing like right. your first chapter you're like i'm gonna take out muhammad ali yes. burnham is like i'm gonna take out dante yeah right no, dante it's, it's an amazing book <laughs> he's yeah. like Don i'm just gonna fucking deconstruct right. your ass right. dante yeah right you know <laughs> and 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 amazing fucking book so mosca has this concept of the political formula the political formula is basically something that you believe whose practical effect on your behavior is to cause you to support the government, is to support whatever is the regime the or state. the powers that yeah. be. So basically, we can assume that within this narrative where basically the I Italians are all like super like Asabia, like I Italian pride. And the Persians are like, yeah, we Persians, we did it. Like, you know, I right. committed Persian crimes, right? Or my ancestors committed Persian crimes, right? You know, um, and so if you see basically, I'm not gonna like try to translate that into today sure. because you probably have an IQ over over 90 out there, yeah. right? You know, but um, um, the, you know, both of those things for the communities in which they are believed will turn out to be basically political formulas. They will turn out to be right. things that are believed that basically and they're, strengthen they're the state. they're also kind of pathologies. Yeah, they're also kind of pathologies. Right. So the thing is that basically, you know, sort of the sum. This is a smart episode, folks. If you can't handle it, Really, you know, uh, yeah, we've done I'm enough. Sorry. We do enough dumb stuff here. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, you have these 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 memes, these ideas that are political formulas that basically strengthen the regime, right? Whatever it is, and so you know, sort of the essence of my like. I'm sorry, we will get to the acid story. No, that's fine. Keep no, going. no, it's okay. We're I love close. this as a callback. We keep we're going. Close. Back. We're close. Yeah. We're close. We're close to the acid story. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, in any case, um, we're um. These political formulas, um, in have you heard of the marketplace of ideas, Tim? Are we it's, in that marketplace right now? Are we selling shit it. in that? We're this in the bazaar. It. We're in the bazaar. You know, bazaar. you're like the world war so fucking. This is not the cathedral. It's the bazaar. It's the bazaar. Now exactly. if Spotify wants to call us, we can be in the cathedral tomorrow. <laughs> we will walk right into yeah. the cathedral. That's a good question. Yeah. Hey, Spot, you know, uh, right. um, uh, let's get some hits on this. Is in, Spotify the cathedral? That's an interesting question. That is an interesting. Okay, let's okay. let's That's let's uh, let's road. table that one. Down the road. I don't want to get that deep. Okay, okay I want to keep this shallow. Yes. You know, for your. I want to bottom out at like 95 IQ. Okay. Like Matt Damon, Perfect. like janitors at Harvard. Perfect. You know, right. You know, yes. and um, <laughs> so anyway, so, um, you know, in the marketplace of ideas, we entrust a lot of things to that marketplace. We say, for example, of virology, we right. say, hey, who should make decisions about virology? And our answer is the virologist. Right. How, how's that? How's that working out for you? Yeah. Right. right. And so, you know, the, um, you know, the conclusion is that basically 
you know, those systems were put in place to basically take power out of the hands of politics and politicians. That was the early progressive movement under T.R. Woodrow Wilson. And the thing is, when I say take power out of the hands of politics and politicians, what I really mean is take power out of the hands of democracy. Right. And so basically, we sort of kept this form of government in name the way Britain is nominally like a monarchy or something because it has this crown Kardashian, you know. Right. Um, but um, we moved it to these marketplace, uh, these specialized marketplaces of, of ideas in the world of experts. And we said, you know what? This world of experts is a marketplace of ideas. And this is a world in which ideas are competing with each other. And, you know, people may be right, they may be wrong. There's a lot of buyers, there's a lot of sellers. The things that are good and cheap and efficient are gonna beat the things that suck. Right. We encompass every time we fly on an airplane. I've been on a lot of airplanes recently. We encompass that to a marketplace of, to an actual marketplace. Sure. The marketplace of ideas is analogous to that. It should work. And the truth will outcompete fiction. And I think truth overall in these marketplaces does outcompete fiction. The problem is that power also outcompetes weakness. Right. And so we have these ideas that are basically empowering or self-empowering that basically um, sort of, you know, like dominate these markets and become basically there's totally unaccountable and there's no power that can remove them. So for example, you know, one of the things that, so for example, just for the experts, right? Yeah. These experts council on foreign relations. Are those the experts? Those are definitely the experts. International monetary fund. Are those the experts? Sure. But I here's another okay. example. Here's another example. Okay. Basically, um, you know, Peter Daszak and his friends. Yes. Yes. You may have covered that. Yeah, well, I've, we haven't covered it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, sure. you know what I'm talking about. So yes. the best place to read about Peter Daszak and his, his friends is in all places. One of my favorite magazines, um, it's called um, Vanity Fair. Yes. And for some reason, Vanity Fair has done some very good articles lately. Yes. I'm not sure what happened there. Maybe yeah. they took some acid. I right. don't know. We'll get to the acid right. soon. Sure. Um, um, but they did two really excellent articles about the birth of COVID that were not you know, basically beholden to the virology industry. And right. I think that basically probably the previous industry that it has done as much damage as the virology industry to human health is probably the tobacco industry. Right. And so basically when you sort of look at what happened in, in virology, it's sort of as good a case against the American system as Chernobyl is against the Russian system. Right. The difference is it killed about a thousand times as many people. Right. Um, maybe 10,000. Right. Clear. A lot more. And, 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 you know, essentially what happened here is, you know, there's a funny way to tell the story about COVID, which is a kid. Remember, I grew up as a And you were one of the first people yeah. on the uh, internet to say this is going to be a problem. Yes, yes. Yes. I was saying I was I was I started writing a piece in the middle of January. I actually started investing in COVID. I bought like deep out of the money puts. Wow. It was insane to be betting on COVID because you become like pro COVID. You start right. talking your book. Yeah, that was course. really weird. Yeah. That really biased my coverage, by the yeah, way. Of course. Um, um, I'll admit that. <laughs> yeah. And and that's sort of in a way, that's the same effect as the effect that corrupts these these systems. So what happened in the case of here's my narrative of COVID. So when I was a kid, I was in in the Commonwealth world and like Cyprus, and it was very easy to get like British books. One right. very common form of British books were these books by Gerald Durrell, brother of Lawrence Durrell, uh, HBO, where someone had the, you know, the Durrells in Corfu had this beautiful, you know, why not show that was basically made out of his wonderful memoirs. Absolutely great to read when I was 12. And Durrell was a zoologist and he went around collecting little fluffy animals from like imperiled Commonwealth countries in which, you know, barbarians were about at the gates, right? It was just a crazy time. It's like right. the fifties and sixties, like every, yeah. everything is falling apart. Right. And he's collecting beautiful, fluffy animals for his little zoo back in England. And he does well with us and he does well with his books. He founds a zoo in Jersey, uh, not New Jersey, but Jersey. And, um, he basically, um, you know, creates this organization called the Wildlife Trust, which is dedicated to, you know, getting rich old ladies to give money to go and collect little fluffy animals. Sounds like a win. Um, along comes this guy, Peter Daszak, who has some like bullshit degree from somewhere, but is really a science administrator. And he decides, and he, he becomes the administrator of the Wildlife Trust. And he decides that he can start getting grants, bigger grants, better grants, by changing the mission of the Wildlife Trust slightly 
to have it go around instead of collect little fluffy animals, collect, collect viruses, specifically bat coronaviruses. So he turns the Wildlife Trust into something called Echo Health Alliance, if you've heard um, the name, um, which is an organization that basically kind of gets massive grants and redistributes them to scientists to basically find and study bat coronaviruses. Um, and some of this work is done in China. This is not really a thing about Chinese science. Maybe it's something about how like sloppy things are in China, but like there's a word um, for like, I'm going to butcher the right, Chinese. This is, this is a what, uh, Chinese word you were saying. Chao Duo. Chao Duo. It yes. means. No, you did it oh, great. Oh, I, oh, I speak Mandarin. Oh, awesome. Fluently. Awesome. My daughter speaks Mandarin. Fluently. I, fluently. I, I, was, I was like, I was like, wow, I, you just fixed that. Yeah, no, <laughs> I speak fluent, fluent Mandarin. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. 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 So, so basically, so this research into bat coronaviruses is subcracked, subcontracted, uh, you know, which is to like biosafety level two, you know, labs Research facilities, in like the yeah. boondocks of China, right? right. You know, in Wuhan, Wu fucking Han, Wuhan, right, 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 right. You know, it's not Shanghai, yeah. right. You know, and, and it's like, what would be the American equivalent of Wuhan? Um, Detroit, Detroit, right. right. Okay. If we so, heard that you, they were doing the most important or any kind of important <laughs> virus research in, in Detroit, Detroit, we would be, we would scared. be asking more questions. Right, 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 right. right. So this research is basically subcontracted to Detroit. Now, two things about this research. One is its justification is to, quote, predict the emergence of, you know, novel coronaviruses. The cause of this research was the original outbreak of SARS. Right. And in fact, one of the people involved in like virology governance is a technical advisor to the Steven Soderbergh film Contagion, which is well worth watching, um, which is a uh, from the mid aughts, I think. Yes. Which is um, basically explicitly about a bat coronavirus. Yes. So because this happened, basically bat coronaviruses are a problem. So and Peter because Dazic, it's a problem. So, yeah. So we're getting we're, right. we're popping the stack now. So so getting yeah. back to this problem. So, OK, bat coronaviruses are a problem. Therefore, they're important. Therefore, you can get grants to study them. You don't have to rely on little old ladies anymore. Instead right. of collecting animals, you're collecting bad viruses, which means you collect bats. So basically the same thing, right? Right. You're getting all these grants to study bat coronaviruses. The more important um, your um, work is, the more money it will get. Makes sense. We allocate money by importance. Yes. Right. The more dangerous bat coronaviruses are, the more money you will get. Now, bat coronaviruses are bad viruses. To operate in humans, they have to mutate. They have to be changed. They have to be either mutate either naturally through passaging or they have or to be artificially in the lab in the lab. And right. we know that was going on. And we know that basically in the course of like four days, the like head virologists of the world changed their minds, which they'd come into like this looks like a lab leak to this doesn't look like a lab leak. Right. There will never be any accountability for these motherfuckers. Never. And, and there's no power that's going to say, hey, science, you're fucked. And the way in which science is fucked is like this is a good example case, because basically here is this problem of like bat coronaviruses. It's a real problem. No one disputes that. It SARS really emerged from animals. It was not a weird Soviet experiment that escaped. Right. So it is possible for this to be a threat because it is possible for it to be a threat is a problem. Therefore, one can get grants to study this. The worse a problem it seems to be, the more grants you're going to get. So you have basically a feedback loop in the marketplace of ideas in which this idea basically brings power to that market. Right. So if you're basically a bat coronavirus researcher and you're like, you know what, what are we going to do if we predict an outbreak? Right. It's like predicting, I predict there will be an earthquake in the Bay Area. Okay, let's build our houses a little right. stronger. Right. right, you know, right. What, what have you actually done here? Like, uh, was any of this research useful in solving the actual outbreak? So, Absolutely so not. The, the profit motive in the marketplace of ideas right. can corrupt. Right, but yeah. it's not specifically, it's sort of, when you think of a yeah. profit motive, that's not really the way academics think. They think right. of like an empire building motive. They think that's of right. like, my career is more successful if this is a bigger problem. Yes. You know, and so they basically play Pokemon with bat coronaviruses and then they like mutate their fucking Pokemon to make them as dangerous as possible in like basically low rent Walmart tier right. labs in Detroit. Right. And then they're basically like, in, you know, when you step back, the important thing is when you, when you pull the camera back and you look at this behavior, 
Okay, this is absolutely. So we've kind of been blaming is, China for this. No, but no. China, we're letting China off the, and we are a fan of, of China on this show, and we believe in one China. We don't even know what Taiwan is. <laughs> so incredibly based, yes, incredibly yes. based. But this isn't a China okay. problem. It's this is a, a U.S. Okay. problem. U.S. This is a problem with, with with the way we do shit. And we basically said we're going to take the experts. You know, who's going to watch the watchdogs? Ancient political question. Right. And they're like, well, why don't the experts watch the watchdogs? Excellent answer. And then the question is, who watches the experts? And they're like, well, you know, I guess they could watch themselves. Right. Right. And when we, they watch themselves, they do shit like this, which is every bit as dumb as like what it was done in fucking Chernobyl, where they're like, let's turn off the backup, backup, backup safety systems By the to way, prove that, that our that, reactor is safe if yeah. we turn off the safety systems. That right. breakdown of COVID was the best I've ever heard. Thank you. I have never heard it anywhere else. Thank you. And will I hear it anywhere else? Who the fuck knows? That, uh, see, and that's the problem. <laughs> because by the way, you just did yeah. in a few minutes in, in the most succinct way I've ever heard. And I read and listen to stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. You literally broke down not only the problem, but what incubates the problem and why the problem won't go away. Yeah. 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 Okay. In fact, these motherfuckers are getting even more funding. That's like, right. Because their shit is uh, important. Now, I mean, because now their shit is important. The like, funding that, is going to be right. Out I mean, of because control. we're uh, it's off the fucking shots. You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, the things they're going to be making now. Yeah. 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 No. No. And just you know, there's more research for I mean, everything involved in this, right? And so inevitably, there's a little skepticism around gain of function. You know, it's like you don't want to call it that. You know, but this is everywhere. You know, it's like I have a you know friend who um is um I'm going to just guy's his identity. He's a leading figure in a film in a field that is related to physics. Okay. And it's related enough that he knows physics quite well. And I was talking about um, him talking about this problem with him. And um, he was like, um, oh, yeah, you know, why, you know, in physics, it's so bad that there are entire workshops about string theory that aren't about string theory. They just have to actually pretend to be about string theory because the string theorists are in command of the funding because physics <laughs> is funded by physics. Right. So the thing is, when that starts to happen in like the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan, right? Right. You're basically just like the idiots are in charge and doing idiotic things, and there is no accountability for them anywhere in any possible way, shape, or form. Right. So let's get back to the acid. So um, I, I think motherfuckers deserve a break after that. Yes. Um, I, anyway, so- You're um, digesting it. Cause that, I mean that, by the way, it, and, and not even to just be you know, overly complimentary, but like, it's amazing that, that, that not only has that not been talked about more um, broadly, right. but it hasn't been put in a context yeah. that people can understand. Well, and, and, and not only understand- that that this is a huge problem, but that it is it is by design and the design continue it self perpetuates. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. For and this is poverty. This is everything, right? Yeah. Right. This is poverty. This is homelessness. I was oh, in San yeah. Francisco. There are guys with like devil horns on all fours <laughs> on fentanyl. Oh, you, were, you were in Door Street. You were in Door Street. I, no, where was it? I was in the this Tenderloin. Was the, it was, this was the piss orgy rally. I was rally, in El like. Farolito eating a quesadilla oh. and I'm in the mission and I'm watching all this stuff go on and I love that city, but it has problems. It has issues. And I'm going and I'm looking I lived at there these. For 20 Yes. And I'm looking at these co compassion centers, homeless Compa centers, navigation centers on every street. Naviga the navigation yeah. centers. And no one's in them. And no and, one cares. And, and, no, it's insane. And it's, it has it's nothing like, to do with anything. And it's run by the homeless industrial complex. That's right. It, you know, like, and like the chief executive, I'm not giving too much away, but like the chief, like expert of the San Francisco homeless complex. Yeah. Was actually my girlfriend twenty years ago. Oh uh, my god! <laughs> oh my so, god! So it's you did it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so you know, and that really informed me a lot about this kind of mentality, right? Yeah. Um. Anyway, like, yeah, it's 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 sort of everything. Um. I've had this uh, sore in my mouth on the right side of my mouth forever, and I keep biting my cheek, and any because I keep biting my cheek, which makes it like it's so, like inflamed and I keep biting it again. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? Sometimes you can get by doing things the hard way without realizing it. But when you run a business, doing things the hard way means you're holding yourself and your business back. 
ShipStation gives e-commerce sellers an easier way to manage shipping. So you can take all the energy that goes into managing orders, choosing carriers, and printing labels, and use it to grow your business. No wonder why ShipStation is already trusted by 100,000 sellers. You know what ShipStation is. Basically, they run your back office. They handle all your shipping needs. They work with multiple carriers, so you can be focused on the important parts of your business Originations, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Quality control, keeping customers happy. And ShipStation is working with Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and more. And they let you automate processes like fulfillment and tracking so you can save time managing orders while keeping customers really happy. You also get deeply discounted shipping rates normally reserved for Fortune 500 companies. 98% of companies that use ShipStation for a year. Keep using it for as long as they're in business. Hey, ShipStation isn't magic, but it will make your shipping stress disappear. Sign up using promo code Tim Dillon. How many day free trial would you think they'd give? Oh, man, for free? I mean, for free. In this economy, you can't give much economy, away for, for free. free. I don't know, a couple days? You'd think what? <laughs> I don't know, like maybe half of a day. <laughs> I would think. It would be 20 minutes <laughs> where they would give you a trial for free to see if you liked it. Sure. Do you know what they're doing? Tell them, tell them what they get. I don't even know if this is smart. They're giving you so much. 60 days. Oh, they're going to go out of business. <laughs> 60 fucking days? Are you nuts? How do you care about the customer that much? Go. That's two months. Go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page and type in Tim Dillon. ShipStation, make ship happen. And by the way, not only have we used this, but you know who used this and used our promo code and uses it for their business is Sam Talent to ship his book. He uses it. He loves it. He loves it. It works for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he is using ShipStation. ShipStation.com, promo code Tim Dillon. Everybody loves Athletic Greens. Everybody, what do you do? You take it in the morning. It's good for digestion, energy. It's simple. I like the taste. I send it to family and friends. I bring it with me when I travel. Don't you? Yes, yeah, I give it to my mom. Here's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's gut health, more energy, optimized immune system, do, I mean, what else do you people want? It's it's a mild tropical taste, because you know when you, you when you have these uh, healthy things, they sometimes you go, oh, I'm I'm prepared for it to be really gross. Sure. And then you try it and you're spitting it out mm. on the subway. You go, I don't want this. But Athletic Greens tastes mildly tropical, um, and it's lifestyle friendly. Whether you're eating keto paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free. It has less than one gram of sugar. No GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. Tell me a story about Athletic Greens. So this is... Tell me something about it. So literally... I want to hear no, no, from you. Tim, literally... Tell me something. This is what rich people do. You know all the time. They I, they get vitamin injections. That's right. It's hundreds and hundreds so of dollars. So much money. Blood replacement therapy. This stuff is less than... children... <laughs> The, it's a lot. It's a lot. It is a lot, but this is less than a cup of coffee a day. It's less than three dollars oh, a day. Oh my! You don't God. have to go to the doctor get the injection. But you take it, and from what I understand, and because I've used it, basically you just throw it in some goddamn water, and you put it in your fucking body. Well, you don't have to swear, but sure, yeah. I mean, but I'm passionate about it. Yeah, I get it, and I swear all the time. It's just part of your vocabulary, I guess. Well, but if I care and I'm passionate, I swear. Mm. If I didn't care. Maybe I wouldn't swear, but I care because Athletic Greens is helping people, regular people, every day become gods. And it helps with inflammation. It's, I mean, and it, you get inflamed by everything now. So here's what I'll tell you, folks. I'm not kidding about this. Joe Rogan does it. He takes it. <laughs> To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Tim Dillon. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash 
Tim Dillon to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Do it, Mom. And and you like taking you take it every day. So just take it. Um, you know, thank you for helping me make my cake smooth brain just because you look like a hockey coach from the 70s. And, it, it, and it's, it's 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 such a comforting form. Do you use do you use let me here's a question. Yes. Do you ever use the accent? You talk in the New York accent. I don't I, I just whatever accent I have, which is kind of, I guess, East Coast, mm -hmm. vaguely racist. Right. Uh, that's just what I do. I was in New York and I was hearing, yeah. you know. People talk the way my grandfather talked, and you yeah. know, and I can kind of do that, but I also feel like I'm kind of yeah. ripping off the Sopranos or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just, it, it feels kind of fake. I have a Long Island accent, which I think is yeah. oh, it, it's in a weird way. It's subtler. It's, it's subtler. subtler. It's kind of it has a little hint of Boston, yeah. New England yeah. Yeah, too. Sure. Um, so let's get to the let's accent. Get back to that. So am, how long, how long do we have here? As long as you want. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Sure. You're, so, you're, you're anyway, a anyway, anyway, you know, this is just a lead up from my biography. So I drop out of grad school in 1994, um, and. And I'm also really have a social life again after really not having a social life in high school and college because right. I was like totally the wrong fucking age. Right. But I start grad school. And I mean, I'm, it was a crime to go on a date with you. Uh, yeah, it's exactly. Like insane. Yeah. Right, that's true. Right. That's right. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. really thinking about right. that, but you yeah. know, no, like, I mean, it's, it's wild. It's very yeah. true. It's wild. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, um, you know, but as you see, I'm a normal human being, of course, you know, but, you um, um, you know, yeah, I know you're laughing deep down inside me. Yeah. Like, never mind. But uh, <laughs> the, um, in any case, I drop out of grad school. I'm like, here's here's my plan. I'm going to drop out of grad school. I'm going to go succeed in the new CD-ROM and multimedia bubble. Um, and um, I'm going to make... A what year is this? 1994. Okay. I'm going to make a pile of money. I'm, by the way, going to move my very sophisticated girlfriend who is... Uh, you know, seven years older than me and has issues uh, who I met on the internet because we were both little rock stars in this little fucking literary group. On Usenet? On Usenet. Fuck yeah. Talk Bizarre if you're out there listening. Fuck yeah. Um, fuck yeah. You know, I was on talk.bizarre and alt.peeves. I have like juvenilia all over these sites, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and really quality people. I used to like, on alt.peeves, I used to flame Charlie Strauss, the well-known science fiction writer yeah. all the time. He now hates me. Um, all these people hating me. It's really sad. Um, the, it's the, crazy that the people's idea of you yeah. is radically different, really, yeah. from I, I from what I find. Or, or, or let's get yeah. to acid. Let's we'll get, get to acid. acid. You can get right. this flattery shit later. Yeah. Uh, you know, acid, right? So uh, in any case, um, I drop out to work at this funky little like Hollywood associated company called Chaos Tools. We actually you ever see the VR film Lawnmower Man. Yeah. Lawnmower Man. Oh, Chaos that's when Tools. they made good things. Oh, that was fucking amazing. Chaos yes. Tools did the graphics for Lawnmower Man. I love so it. So I'm working at Chaos Show Tools. Show people that. I'm yeah. working on K uh, XAOS, Chaos Tools, yeah. uh, you know, our, uh, also known as Chaos Inc. And um, they did, um, you know, Photoshop plugins. And they also, like, they needed, like, they basically did this project that was, like, way above their britches. It was sort of like, in the end, the thing that I did that actually kind of worked later. Right. Um, but that was, that's my like future career. This was my present one. It was actually a shit show and a disaster and like an insane experience. So this in 1997, like this collapses, like, you know, my whole social group has collapsed in a series of like insane infighting because we're basically like, you know, I'm maybe more uh, asocial than some of these other people, but they're all sort of doing this thing where they're well outside high school, but they behave like high school kids. Right. Uh, you know, and I thought I was doing something different, but I was actually doing the same thing. And right. um, many such cases, as our right. president has said. Yeah. And um, the, um, and, you know, this explodes. My relationship with this troubled woman explodes. And basically all I have is a job offer from a company in Berkeley, a lease on an apartment and a company and, you know, in Berkeley and some family back on the East Coast. Right. So, you know, what do you do in a situation like that? So basically, my feeling was that the right thing to do was to take a shit ton of acid and go see the new John Woo film. I think that's correct. I think that was absolutely the right thing to do yes. in a way that was kind of the birth. I mean, and when I say like, like, I, I'm, you know, I, I was reasonably experienced dropping acid by myself right. as one should be. I mean, when a full grown man, don't don't try this when you're 13. Right. But like, you know. 
uh, you can sit and like in the closet, you know, for eight hours on acid. Yes. You're a man, right? You right. know, um, and there's, there, I mean, it's not the only thing that can make you man. It's just one of right. them, right? You know, so. Um, it's a Native it, American ritual. It's a Native American yes. ritual. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I didn't have any peyote and I couldn't uh, sit in the smoke shop, but uh, smokehouse, but um, I could go see and see the new John Woo film, which I knew nothing about, which was, in fact, if you're familiar with the film, um, it's called. Um, it's with um, Nicolas Cage yes. and John Travolta. Yes. It's called Face Off. Face Off. That's right. And, you know, it has this wonderful signature move where he's like, I'm going to take his face. <laughs> and, and, and absolutely brilliant. And, um, and, and, you know, so to see this with no expectations, no spoilers, no nothing on just like, you know, oh, and it was also my birthday. Um, right. and, and I forget that part. Um, it was 1997, so I was turning 24, and I was like, okay, um, why not do this? And um, I was like, wow, you know, uh, we were talking about this earlier on the show, or perhaps before the show, I'm not sure when you started filming. And, um, you know, it really is an important part of a certain kind of experience. Yes. And, you know, that experience should be as intense and disturbing as possible. Yes. And, and, yes. and, 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 For and sure. you know, knowing that that, ex you know, and, and now I'm going to describe, you know, OK, we're getting into the difficult. I guess we covered some difficult political stuff earlier. Sure. But, uh, you know, we'll get to harder stuff later, maybe. But let's go. Um, you know, so but the next thing I did, um, which really I think it. Honestly, I only lasted that's that this company are the for, same are the same people in Silicon Valley. Silicon. I silicon. love that you say silicon. That's so like I know it's so silicon. great. Silicon. <laughs> it's so great. Keep silicon. saying it. no, 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 never change. I, A friend of mine does that and yeah. it's like perfect. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 are they the same people? Because it, when I look at the ruling class, I feel like the people that are there. If are, you look are, at the campaign yeah. contributions from Google, they're about 99 percent blue. Um, we're, right, but we're, we know the least about, like, we know what motivates Wall Street guys. It's a lust for gargantuan sums of money. Yes. What motivates these tech utopians? Are they? Is, I'm going to surprise you. I'm okay. going to surprise you. It's a lust for gargantuan sums of money. Wow. Um, okay. And, and yeah. so, <laughs> there you go. There it is. God and, damn it. So, 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 not to be too shocking here or anything. Yeah. Right. You know, but, um, and not that is I made. Matt, is Marin County expensive? I had no, no idea. No. Not, no, you know, and, yeah. and, and so, you know, I, I never actually have really succeeded entirely in Silicon Valley. I've sort of like semi non failed. It was my next, so I lasted like nine months at this company. I sort of never quite clicked with them socially. I think I was just a little too weird. Yeah. Only the only one who wound up with like weird politics. It was a very apolitical time though. Um, but you know, they were, they were great. The nineties was great. They it was, were great. They it were, they were great political people. time. And then I, yeah. then I worked at the, then I actually made some money in the dot com bubble, which became my like nest egg to do this insane thing that I did later. But let's go back to the start of this company. Um, we're not going to talk about. Uh, so I arrive at this company and I start there and I was like, wow, this is an insane experience. We're not going to talk about acid anymore. Um, this is just uh, mushrooms. Um, we're yeah. also not going to talk, talk about the time I smuggled mushrooms back from um, Japan uh, after 9-11 in a jar of miso. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and um, so, yeah, we're not going there. That's a I think the statute of limitations is bad. But, you know, and the, they the, will come for you. They, yeah, exactly. Yes, They'll yeah. probably use that as their excuse. to. That'll be Vanity Fair's next that, article. Exactly. <laughs> after 9-11. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the man who drove America crazy right. with his, you know, anyway. So um, um, the miso wasn't very good for them. As during, uh, you know, yeah. in any case, so um, I have a bag of mushrooms and I find basically... Um, you know, the coolest person, like the hippest hippie dude who's wearing like tie dye at there. And I noticed that the UC theater, the repertory theater right around the block from her office is playing a film that I wanted to see. And so I suggested this guy, um, his name was Jimmy. Hi, if you're right there, Jimmy. Um, he's like, I want to go see, why don't we take some mushrooms? Just perfect kind of timing. Mushrooms is shorter, you know, yeah. shorter trip. Why don't we go take some mushrooms and... Um, go see the film that's showing at the UC. And he's like, what's the film? I'm like, it's called Das Boot. He's like, what's it about? I'm like, um, it's like, I don't know, footwear or something? Yeah. I don't know if I actually said that, but uh, <laughs> have you seen Das Boot? Yes. Um, uh, have you seen it on acid? 
Not yet. Uh, the, you know, it has to be the you've seen the director's cut, right? The three hour version. I've seen the really long one. The real yeah, that's yes. the director's cut. That's the director's cut. You know, imagine like you're there, right? You're watching yeah. the movie in the theater, like big, big, big sound. Yeah, big sound, big sound, big sound, big screen, big picture. You're like, you know, basically, you know, 500 feet under the Strait of Gibraltar, and like British destroyers are trying to like crush you in an instant yeah. by throwing garbage cans of TNT right. into the water. Yeah. For about 45 minutes, as it's I recall. It's living in that, in that Acme explosion of a cartoon. Right, right. right. It's yeah. not, I mean, it's not really claustrophobic. Well, it is called right. claustrophobic, right? Yeah. You know, but um, um, yeah, he was, uh, I think he was okay with me after right. that. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> the relationship never really became yeah. warm, you know. And, when when uh, did you leave tech? When did I leave be, tech? When so, were you? When were you just like I'm gone? So, so basically twice. You've been writing under Mentor Small Bug. I was writing. So I see. Uh, let, yeah, let me like finish yes. my like yes. stupid ass biography. So, um, because I, I've told it in the hopefully a non boring way. So no, it's great. So, so the um, in any case, so I worked at this company um called. It first had this cool name of Unwired Planet. Um, which was a cool, that's a cool name, right? Love it. Unwired Planet. And we did smartphones before the smartphone. We were doing smartphones in the 90s. Wow. Smartphones in the fucking 90s. We had this modified version of HTML called WML. Some of you assholes out here are so old that you actually work with WML. Um, we shipped about a billion WAP browsers, and I was the browser guy. I wrote the, rewrote the browser core. So technically about a billion units of my code were shipped for which we were paid nothing at all. And about like 30,000 people used the thing actually. And it was a terrible fucking user experience. One time right. I was actually, I actually tried to use it to get directions yeah. in like, you know, um, <laughs> like 1999, I'm like trying to drive somewhere and I'm like, wow, is this, this is your own confusing. code? You're using your own code. Yeah, I'm using yeah. my own code. I tried to avoid using it because it was just too <laughs> embarrassing. I mean, the thing is we didn't control the end to end experience. Right. Like this is how crazy it was at the firm in Berkeley. Um, uh, you know, okay. I named chaos tools. This is geo Works. And um, basically we did, the Japanese were the people that had smartphones first. And the Japanese, you know, these Japanese hardware companies that we were working with had this idea about how to build smartphone software, which was very simple, which is that they would design the experience and we would, they would send us screenshots and we would write code that looked like the screenshots. You will notice that, for example, Windows is not developed this way. Right, <laughs> right, and so right. This was basically doing software in the way a Japanese hardware company thought you should do software. Right. You know, software is one of the things the Japanese are notoriously worst at. And um, and so, you know, this is a sort of very painful experience, kind of like you want to, you know, this is the future, you want to do it, but you're basically working in this just like completely retarded way. Um, and then I moved to Unwired Planet, which was in the same industry, which was trying to solve the same problem, but they were like more sophisticated. And so they were building like relationships. And so they hired, for example, this guy who is the former like secretary of the interior under Carter or some shit like that. And they knew how to schmooze and their right. basic principle was like, we're going to schmooze it up with the carriers and basically get the carriers to ask for this product and um and tell them about the wonders of the internet and um i don't want to descend too deep into like business speak here for sure um but um you know this company was run by one of these types you find in silicon valley named alain rossman and alain rossman i'd heard like really bad things about alain rossman from the geoworks people because a lot of him them worked with him at this at&t attempt to do mobile phones in like 1991 early 90s, which got like blown apart by this guy. Anyway, he was sort of one of these like Steve Jobs wannabes. And right. so, you know, I sort of imagine him like flanking the halls, like um, Jeff Goldblum in um, Steve Zissou, you know, right. With, like, right. He was basically talked about as if he was Jeff Goldblum and right. Steve Zissou. I forget it's the name. Yeah. Of the, the, uh, the uh, underwater. Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 There we go. There was the accent underwater. Underwater. <laughs> um, and, and, um, so anyway, so, you know, I moved to his company because they seem to actually be getting shit done in like, you know, Europe and America and, um, you know, meet this guy. I never worked directly for him or anywhere close, but he looks like a homeless chess player. But anyway, he has, Lynn is very, very nice in Belgian, you know. Um, anyway, so we had this plan of basically creating this alternate world of like self, the cell phone internet. And um, I was lucky enough to be one of those, you know, there's sort of three kinds of people in Silicon Valley. There's people who don't make any money. 
There's people who um, make money off shit that doesn't end up working. And then there's people who make real money off of shit that works. So it's very right. lucky to be someone who made a little bit of money off of shit that doesn't work. Right. Anyway, sort of the, the world conquering attitude of phone.com which we changed our name to, which is sort of the CTO was like, Ooh, phone phone com. Dot com. Horrible. So we went to the dorkiest name ever. Uh, Unwired which, Planet, much better. I know, yeah. I know, but it was the day of the portal and our CTO was like browsing the domain name registry. He's like, I can buy phone.com for $50,000. He should have just kept it. And, uh, and, and does this and then we become phone.com and then we go public. As like, phone.com. As phone.com. And Ugh. there was a little contest within the company yeah. to choose the stock symbol that we would go public under. Yeah. And one don't, of my please friends. Please don't tell me it's a, like a phone, like an actual phone. No, no, okay. no. It's a four letter symbol, right? You oh, know, like oh a that, stat, that. Right, stat, right. Yeah, 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 yeah not okay. a logo. It's a stock symbol, right? So a friend of mine was talking, my like office mate was talking to me later. He's like, well, you know, I was going to send in the suggestion that for phone.com, it should be PHCM, which could be pronounced fuck em. <laughs> right. And then he was like, no, that would be unprofessional. So yeah. we go public. And of course, not only is our stock symbol so fuck them, but we later merged with software.com, whose stock symbol was SWCM. Oh, Everybody so thought fuck them and was, suck them. Fuck them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You said it right. You know, I thought, you know, you'd never get it. But, you yeah. know, the, the um, um, in any case, basically, needless to say, if you bought fuck them at the IPO, you know, at its peak, it became like a $10, $10 billion company. Right. If you bought and held, you know, it became worthless. Right. So, so if you, you know, bought and you sold when you should, you made a lot of you money. You made a lot of money. Right. And if you were employed as a pre IPO employee, you, you got know, stock you advisory got stock. shares. You know, this right? is the day yeah. of the classic stock option. So right. I basically wound up with, I think, you know, you know, in terms of the problem was I sold the stock and then I bought other technology companies because that, I was okay. convinced right. that the future was happening. The future was in ha fact right. happening. It wasn't happening quite yet. Right. right. So, you know, if you bought like web van stock because you believe that online grocery delivery was the future, which I did. And it was, yeah, you 20 still, years later, you still got fucked in the ass. Right. Right. So, you know, with the, and other people got fucked in the ass worse. Other people ended up with actual like tax liabilities. Anyway, the right. bubble explodes. I switch companies, you know, then I'm like, okay, wow. You know, I had this plan when I dropped out of school, like that I was going to do like independent computer research, science research. Um, I just met my wife at that point. Um, and you know, the company I was working for, which was like a Japanese owned company that used to be, remember the Palm pilot? Yes. Like they bought the code for that. It was, it was a shit show. Um, and, um, it was on its way down and everything was on its way down and it was early to, you know, 2002. Um, and I just met my wife and she, we didn't get married for eight years, but she was like, go for it. Right. So I quit my job and I was like, OK, I'm going to do the thing that I wanted to do when I drop out of grad school. I'm going to basically do effectively an you know, unsupervised Ph.D. thesis in computer science. And so that's kind of what I spent from 2002 to 2013. I spent doing um, and by like 2011 or 2010, um, I had two kids and was completely out of money. Um, and I'd right. also was depending on the kindness of my wife and my mother, neither of whom was rich. My wife just had a day job as a tech writer. Um, and they basically were like, Hey, you know, you got to actually fund this and make this a thing or right. like, get a fucking job because basically right. like here I was for the last 10 years as a parent with kids, basically no income to speak of, no savings. And what am I doing? I'm doing these insane fucking projects. One of them is just this weird ass blog right you know right and the other was this, unqualified reservations yeah, unqualified right. reservations right um which someone has you know extracted from blogspot and um which would have banned it long ago and and put it up on unqualified unqualified reservations org. by the right. way my current blog is the gray, gray mirror, mirror on gray Substack. mirror that's gray with an a the american way and um right. and and the um and you're writing this as a hobby yeah, I'm writing it as a you know it was a hobby. It's not there's nobody's blogging as a profession in fucking 2010. Right, right. So you know by 2013, not even in 2013. Right, right. So by 2013, basically, like you know, Do you notice the readership growing. Yeah, the readership definitely grown. Right? right, you know, there was definitely a real readership. I was definitely like a nano celebrity in a way. I was already used to being a nano celebrity on the internet. I was a nano celebrity when I was 19 on the internet, but it was a much smaller like internet. It was used, uh, and it was not. It was used net, and it was right. not for landing. It was just in this. It was weird, for shaming that writer. Weird, 
and it was it was right. just in this okay. weird ass literary world. Gotcha. Uh, you know, um, and uh, which is actually like a lot of that early using this stuff became foundational and became sort of part of core internet culture. Right. Like through like a lot of it went to like something awful. Right. Right. You know. Um. In any case. Um. You know. So. Um. I basically stopped blogging in 2013 because I had to turn this thing into a company. Um, this is called Urbit. Um, this is uh, it still exists. It's out there. Please don't look into it. Uh, it's not cool at all. Um, and um, I mean that. It's also too complicated to use. Um, and remember our talk about barriers earlier? Yes. Um, you do if you have an IQ of over you know 110. If you yes. don't. Never mind. It doesn't matter what we're talking right. about. Um, you know, let's get to some jokes, drugs, drug yes. humor. Right. In any case, um, so um, uh, so I started this thing. And then, um, you know, of course, because I have this interesting, like, checkered reputation, um, the association of my checkered reputation and having this, like, cool, insane... Because basically what I was doing for those 11 years was I was saying, okay here's how we normally build computing systems. This way that we do it comes, is very accidental and came out of history. And if you have, literally, if you're wearing an Apple watch, it works the way it does because it's basically a, a structural copy of an IBM mini computer from, or not digital, from a DAC right. mini computer from like 1975. And because that's the way computers worked in 1975, certain decisions have been taken that can't be untaken. It's the way like evolution can't design like a right. human with six arms, right. you know, right? You just can't have a mutation that does that. And so you're sort of locked into this one kind of way of doing things. And so what I was trying to answer was the question of if you rethought this from scratch, like imagine you get like a USB drive with like the operating system from an alien spaceship. Right. And it's got, it doesn't have anything that reminds you of like a, you know, they didn't have a digital equipment corporation that made a machine called the Vax in 1976. Right. right? So, uh, you know, how's it going to work? It's going to be sort of completely structurally different. And so like my thing is so different. This was stupid actually, but I was like, this is going to be so different that zero means true and one means false. Right. That's actually just mathematically more beautiful. Right. Um, you know, for stupid way, reasons. It causes all kinds of stupid bugs. Right. But in any case, this is still this is still a thing. This is still a thing in, you know, uh, 2022. You but should not look But we won't look it, it up because it's too complicated. It's too complicated right. and you want to understand it and it's not cool. So, okay, so in any case, yeah. in any case, basically, so I basically quit, um, you know, I um, ejected myself. I have actually no association with the project at all. Um, now I do have some urban real estate, but I have no stock in the company. I have no power and I'm not involved. With, I don't, I'm not, I can't even tell you how to use this thing. Right. Actually, it's probably too complicated for me. Founders farewell. There you go. There you um, go. Um, He's um, out. um, 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 right. Now, right. Did you leave? Was it amicable? Were you like, I'm out? Oh yeah. I pushed myself out. I gotcha. was, I was, compl I was always completely in control of the company. So, okay. um, the, um, um, the, it was more than amicable, and I'm good friends with the uh, founder, but again, not very cool. You know what's cool is that picture there. That's a still from Godard's Contempt. Um, yeah, I was just about to say. That's the, did you recreate? No, was, no, no, that's not me. That's that, that's Bernardo. You know, like, yeah, that's, that's some famous, yeah. some famous Italian actor. Yeah, uh, it's actually an Italian. Uh, that's actually the um, that is the Via. Um, God, um, when we see so you an, enjoyed anonymity for a long yes. time. Yeah, writing well, this blog. Uh, here's actually no, actually, I doxed myself okay. fairly early in the blog. OK, here's a funny story about the way I doxed myself. Um, what are you laughing at? Like a lunatic. Just the <laughs> it's just a look because you said you like you, you like the anonymity. He goes, no, I doxed myself very early. Yeah, it's just okay. a funny quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's a villa by the author of Caput. Caput yeah. with two T's. Okay. Look that up. Um, he designed this villa. He was a fascist novelist. Um, he designed this great novelist. He designed this villa himself. I just look up uh, Caput with two T's villa. Okay. Um, and great I having love, this guy. I love real estate. Yeah, yeah. This is amazing. I if love, I could afford this, if, I, if Urbit I, takes over the world. Oh, my I, God. No, no, no. Caput with a K. K, oh, K, with K, a K. With a K. Gotcha. With a K. With a K. Of course, it's a K. Gotcha. There, villa. Um, look for the, Jesus. Curzio Malaparte. Look up Curzio Malaparte. Curzio Malaparte. Okay. God, you're just dominated by like ad searches, right? You know, the fucking Everything internet is, is yeah. fucked. There okay. it is. 
you know, probably. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the uh, that that's the um, stunningly beautiful. That's the Via Mala part. Stunningly okay. beautiful yeah. and like this modernist fascist there it Italian, is, right there. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Great. As I always say, the art is the best part of fascism. Yes, and and the um um <laughs> especially in fucking Italy, right? You can argue with that about Germany, Italy. There's sure. no case. You know, in any case, um um. Sometimes I'm sad. Are you ever sad? Oh yeah. How sad? Depressed. Uh, full of. Uh... Right. Well, I also feel that way, but sometimes I want to make it stop. And you know what I do? Do you use? I, but what do I'll you? I'll tell you what I do. Oh, okay, just tell me. Yeah. I go to Better Help. It's. It's you call people. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain, like learning a new language or taking power naps. There's also BetterHelp online therapy. It's therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat-only therapy sessions. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. You can be matched with a therapist. Guess how long? Uh, uh, Very quickly, I imagine. But I mean, how long? I don't know, like two months? That seems fast to me. You think it's fast. Two months, you think it would be fast. My experience with therapy, it takes months and months it to get ta- it's fit with you, someone you like. It's it taking take you two years. months to get a therapist? It could take years. That's what you're saying. 60 days, is that's what you're saying. Six months is fast to me. Well, let me, I'm going to knock your socks off. They do it in 48 hours. Jesus Christ. I mean, how do they do it? Oh, my God. It's much more, I've said that. How we care for our minds affects how we experience life. So it's important to invest time and care into keeping them healthy. With the minds? Yeah, them healthy. Okay. Do it. Go to betterhelp.com. That's betterhelp.com slash Tim D, T I M D. Uh, You get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Tim D. That's betterhelp.com slash Tim D. Where were we? So, yeah. So um, I doxed yourself early. on. Yeah, I doxed myself early on. So in the way in which I doxed myself is somebody read my blog. This is a funny story, actually, with no point to it. But, uh, you know, I basically somebody contacted me and was like, hey, the way you posted about computer science is like sufficient, you know, to identify you. He mails me um, and I'm like, ah, shit, you know, anyone can tell. And then this is like 2008, nine or whatever. And, you know. In at the start of COVID, I moved to a small town in um, Nevada. You know, the Nevada. Excuse me. If you say yeah. Nevada in, in Nevada, you're gonna have problems. Right. Um. And it's like Persians and Italians, right? right. You know. And um. I just call the whole state Vegas. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So yeah. so so I moved to you know kind of a northern suburb of Vegas, which has a French. I prefer to think of it by the French name. You know, the actor who was in The Professional. Yeah. John. Um. Um. Gerard Depardieu? No, no, no. Jean, 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 uh, you know, Renault. Renault. Oh, yeah, yeah. So exactly, if you, okay. if you refer... Oh, Renault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you, right. you know, it's a much... Renault It's like saying you're going yeah. to Target, right? You're yes, going to the yes. Target in Renault, right? right? You know, <laughs> and um, anyway, um, so I moved to Reno, or Renault, yeah. and, um, and I become friends with this um, guy out who also from, you know, same general vague community rationalist or whatever in Renan and it turns out and I become very good friends with them and then he's like you know Curtis did you know that like in 2009 I was the one who sent that email and he was like you know it was actually pretty hard yeah to figure out who you were I'm sure someone would have done it right and so actually like operating out of the closet has had a couple of different effects it's had the effect of making sure that my like technical work, like my other career um, in like complicated computer science shit um, will always sort of be like basically in computer science, in systems at least, you're trying to establish like a standard. And so having this um, sort of baggage around your neck, for example, there's a Linux file system called RicerFS, which is a very innovative, interesting file system 
and was really one of the leaders to become the future of Linux. You've heard of Linux. This is a yes. nerd thing. You know, and, um, and file, system, the file, file yeah. system is like a nerd part of it, I like think, the liver. Yeah. The liver of the operating system is the right. file system, and you can kind of swap them out, which I wish you could do with livers, frankly. Yes. And um, you can kind of swap them out. And RiserFS was a leading one, and then Hans Riser, that like autistic weirdo who developed and designed this very innovative file system, murdered his wife. Right. Um, and um, the uh, you know, let's get Hans Riser up here. Okay. okay. Uh, and so you know, I didn't murder my wife. She died right. of completely natural causes. Right. In the hospital. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Sorry. Of, of our condolences. Thank you. By thank the way. you. Thank you. Um, and you can go to my website and, you know, read my poetry better, uh, you know, and um, the um, in any case, um, you know, that that crippled, you know, right. his adoption is a standard. Right. You know, on the other hand, it's basically like having this. Um, yeah, exactly. Looks just like me. Hair's a bit shorter, mm. you know, um, and same. Well, didn't write. Same but, expression yeah, in his eyes. That was right. Yeah, there. exactly. You know, and um, um the uh, so he kills and, and his it, wife and it, it hurts the and, Linux and it, file and it hurts system. the adoption of his technology. That's right. Even though it's actually genuinely brilliant technology. Yeah, that's that, not, one has and has hasn't committed to, any murders at all. One has and hasn't committed any murders at all. Right. But in any case, right. basically, but it's also like not a so, sort of social network that like people are on. Right. And so you know, in a way, however. So that's sort of a negative effect, but there's also kind of a positive effect in that, remember how we were talking about Burning Man? Yes. Like the playa is not the Caribbean. You know, imagine right. if they held Burning Man in like, you know, Fort Lauderdale. Right. You know, like it would turn into like, you know, Freak Nick, right? Right, you know? right, right, right. And, and it would not be an environment in which anyone you meet is an old friend you've never met yet. Right. So what, and, and and so, you know. Operating out of the shadows has kind of created operating that. Operating out yeah. of the shadows creates this barrier to entry where you're like, okay, but there's something funky and weird about its fa his the founder. He didn't kill his wife. Maybe he was canceled in some way. Right. Do I dare to use this? And the thing is, if you're a person whose answer to that question is yes, Bear in mind, this is like not something cool that you should look into. Right. Okay. Right. And it's too complicated for you, you to use. It frankly doesn't work very well. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm not sure from what I hear about the engineering since I left, you know. Not great. It's really, it's just like you shouldn't go there. But the thing is basically like, 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 um, you know, having those barriers to entry is a crucial part of like quality control. Now, the problem is, of course, it's sort of also like inimical to growth. Like Clubhouse is another good example of that. Do you remember I mean, Clubhouse? I, I was big on it. Yeah, I, I was into Clubhouse too, right? And then I was in the club, and then and it then suffered quality. It had an eternal September. It had a real problem. Yeah. And uh, it was and, very fun and it was in the very beginning. well technically because done. It was it was a, gr a small group of people mm -hmm. that, and it was very interesting because they would bring on like people every now and then. Like they, I was a comedian, so like I would just sit in these rooms and listen to tech guys talk. Mark and Andreessen then, is and on there right, like all right. the fucking time. And then there would be a time to go. This guy now we need someone to be funny. Yeah, and then I'd be funny. Right, and, and, and you and it, you should have Mark and you know go and, and then see it if, all works. Do you want to see, like, you should go yeah. and see if Mark Andreessen will do your show. But then, uh, you know, yeah, the, but then uh, they, there was like, they started doing like struggle sessions right. in the in the rooms. And then there was one room called Saudis and Jews. That got <laughs> wild. Man, that, that room got wild. And yeah. I'd, go in, I'd go in there every now and then and say, I'm half Saudi, half Jew. You got to right, yeah, 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 yeah. It gets but us back to the Persians and the Italians. It just degenerated so right. rapidly. Right, right, right. And it just became this like toxic fucking jungle, right? And this and, is and what's happening thought, in America, yeah, kind of. In, in, a, your, in a lot of ways. In your estimation, we have, because uh, it's not a democracy. It is more of an oligarchy. Yeah. We, and that, that's been proven. Columbia Review or Princeton Review, one of them. Yeah. I think Columbia did a study where they went, by any rational standard measure here, this is not a democracy. No, it's, it's not like, a barely republic. You know, who are yeah. the people who even matter, right? You know, but yeah, it's it's like, it's a shit show. And it's basically like, you know, these are sort of two, the corruption by like power that we talked about in yes. virology and the sort of like corruption by like low quality, which isn't really happening. Imagine if, if just like there was like virology inflation. Yeah. So like anyone could call themselves a virologist. Right. Right. You know, or like you could basically like Harvard like lowers its standards. So you're basically and like, we, we're, you know, Harvard yeah. is selling, you know, Harvard virology PhDs are Four ninety nine, right? Right. You know what right. happens to the virology community right. then, and what do they start to believe? Right. Well, we just in my whole life, all we've ever seen is political scandals and disasters with absolutely no accountability. Yeah, and so and, yeah. and it's like and culminating here, with here is here is in, and right, all this and, stuff. Here, and yeah. here is here is sort of the like the thing is normally when you say let's take power, you're like okay, 
you have, um, you know, let's get back to like political base. Can we get back to political theory here? We Please. were having an interesting conversation, Please. but yes. it, was, it was too fun. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, um, I want to get people back to like yes. things that are hard to understand to yes. like drive the stupid people away. Yes. Like I want actually your viewership to go down because let's of this. Let's gatekeep. Because let's gatekeep because barriers to entry are really yes. important. Um, in any case, um, so to gatekeep a little, let's go, you basically, what you, you know, the sort of the first conclusion to like jump to when you're in um, sort of a problematic situation is you're like, okay, I'm in a problematic situation instead of like trying to solve this. It's like debugging is sort of the art for this. You know, if you're, if you're a coder and you, you fix bugs, you have the mentality that the bug will never defeat you. If you're beaten once by a bug, it like changes you like honestly as a man or a woman or right. a person. Um, and, um, and, and so you never let that happen. Right. And so you have to have like, you know, in order to basically step back to a place where you know that you are right about everything, you have to say, let me start by assuming that I know nothing. And so I'm living in the year 2022 and like stuff is a little weird. Right. Like the narrative is weird. And maybe it's weird, like in the same way that like the narrative was weird in like the Soviet Union. And you're just like, can I really, you know, the Soviet Union actually, it's funny, there was, a, you know, I'd love an English translation of this. If like you're a rich person out there, there was something called the great Soviet encyclopedia that was basically produced in like the 1960s. That was like Soviet, like Wikipedia, except it was done by the, you know, right. Supreme Soviet. Right. And so basically it was like the Soviet line on everything, the Soviet line in literature, the Soviet line on bio biology, the Soviet line on history. And so it would have an entry for say the English civil war, which would be a Soviet interpretation of the English civil war. It would have a section on the Revolutionary War, the American Revolution, that was a Soviet interpretation of the American Revolution. And if you think there's only one way to interpret the American Revolution, well, like, when was right. that ever true? Right. Right. You know, and, and there's just, like, the view that, like, you one. You smashed the American yeah, Revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you do it very quickly in 10 minutes? I can do it very quickly um, in, like, 15 seconds. The American Revolution is the Vietnam War in the 18th century. It's essentially a civil war between two British political factions by proxy. And that's why the sort of violent events in it don't really seem to make sense in the same way that you look at the Vietnam War and you're like, how is this not like World War II? Right? right. You know, and that's the that's the, the that's the American Revolution. Um, and a great way to to um read about it is if you just go to Google and you type in true history of the American Revolution, works fine. Okay. Um and um you'll actually get a book that was written in 1903. Just go there. Um so that's actually kind of cool. See, the internet sometimes fulfills its promises. It has like, its perks. Like, you know, you know, when Brennan Page were like, we're gonna digitize all the books, like right. before 1923, all the yeah. books that are free, they're like they weren't thinking like, what's the average like political opinion before 1923? Right. Where is it in the Overton window? It's not even in the Overton fucking building. Right. Right. right, you know? right. Even relating it to the Overton window right. is hard. Right. Um, you know, and so in any case, when you see this like problematic situation, what you want to do is to go back to like where you know nothing. And one way to do that is to go way back in time and look at basically the first person who ever wrote coherently about political science, assuming that nobody knew anything, is Aristotle. And so if you go back to Aristotle's system of political science, first of all, in the same spirit as James Burnham's The Machiavellians, you don't actually need to read the politics, you should just read The Machiavellians, um, but um, you know it certainly doesn't hurt. And Aristotle points out that, that there are basically three forms of government monarchy, oligarchy, and democracy. Government of the one, government of the few, government of the many. When you're identifying an oligarchy or aristocracy, your question is always who matters, who is in the loop, right? There's actually right. this great Armando Iannucci film called In the Loop. Like there's this whole like little mini genre of like how the government actually works, which is like the British show, Yes Minister, uh, in the thick of it. All of Yanucci's films are actually kind of like realistic. They're like more realistic than, right. they're not completely real, but they're like more realistic than like CNN. Right. right? Um, and so if you want to look at how things work. Well, well, the Chronicles of Narnia is more realistic than CNN. That may right. very yeah, well yeah. be. That has, you know, the, the same initials right. as well. Right. You know, and uh, the, um, uh, in any case, um, 
So there's three kinds of government. There's monarchy, oligarchy, and democracy, the government of the one, the government of the few, the government of the many. And when you look at the way things work now, it's essentially an oligarchy of prestigious institutions. One way to ask the question of like, who's in power? Like how does power actually work? Not like what's written, you know, in this piece of paper, but like who actually matters is to say, imagine, and you can, you have to be able to say this for any regime, any kind of government. So imagine that you're like a Nazi from outer space. Remember that film, Iron Sky? You're a Nazi from outer space and your goal is to like turn the world Nazi. Your goal is to get as much Nazi power as possible. So the question is, and you can, you can take over a certain number of people with brains. You can like attach a little like Nazi unit to their brain that turns them into like secret Nazis. Right. So without revealing themselves, they try to kind of guide everything in a Nazi direction. So right. they might be like, you know, writing a story about Epstein, they might kind of emphasize his Semitic background, right. you know, and so they kind of right. try and, and sort of tilt reality. And so, and, and I'm skipping, you know, ahead because the question right. is who would they take over? Who would and the answer would be, to, yeah. I, I'm not sure which institution they would want more, whether it's Harvard or the New York times. Right. I don't know. It's kind of doesn't matter or it's hard to tell because they agree with each other completely. Like Harvard, the state department and the New York times, like, you know, they're like peas in a pod. They never fight with your, each other. This is your this term, is like cathedral. the cathedral, where you have all these, you know, supposedly independent institutions. That all agree with each other. That come to the same conclusions They come to the same everything. conclusions. Yeah. And those con well, why do they come to Here's the same conclusions? Question. Why do they, yeah. well, let, me, okay. let me finish for yeah. a sec. Why do they come to the same conclusions? They become to the same conclusions because those conclusions act as political formulas. Okay. For exactly this system. They cause people to think basically you know, experts should be in charge and we should give them a lot of money. Right. And so basically like nobody's in charge of this. Right. And the thing is, when you talk to people, the more important they get, the more they will be like, and people are locally in charge. You have these little emperors, like the Peter Dazaks of the world. Right. But overall, nobody's in charge of this thing. And, and thing, that's what makes it yeah. an oligarchy. And one thing and, that you've said, that's very interesting is an oligarchy tends to produce a very uneven, disjointed, uh, strategy for governance. Yes, because nobody's in charge. Right. You know, and so because nobody's in charge, it, it just, you know, right. it's like there's no accountability. Like there's no organization that can be like, you know, that's sort of superior to Peter Daszak that can say, besides taking like a vote of Congress that says this guy will not get any more funding. Moreover, right. if he doesn't get funding, all of his people will still keep getting funding. So when you, there's no way to like yeah. cut off that, to amputate that right. poisonous arm. Right. And so, you know. You have the same critiques of society or, or you share some critiques yeah. with people on the left, like a Chris Hedges or sure. a, right. Or absolutely. Chomsky. Absolutely. It's very easy to see like pieces of this system. Very, and a lot of easy. people see it very clearly. And it's your, like, but, like foreign policy, like yes. with Chris Hedges. I think there's like a very similar take of this is like a self licking. But his, cone. his take would be strengthen public institutions, more unionizing, more yeah, labor. Which is like giving more money to Peter Daszak. Okay. Right. You know, and so my take basically yes. you know, as a foreign policy take is just shut it all down. Right. Close all the bases, all the embassies. You know what? Right. If you want to deal with the government of France, send an email. If it's really complicated, maybe you can zoom. So it's unwinding the empire. It's unwinding the empire. It's, a, it's an American like Gorbachev doctrine. And, and so the argument or the question question is what happens in that power vacuum is to, to Russia and China sure. step like, up? But let's, yes. let's like, sure. you know, let's, well, that's a pretty deep hole. Let's okay. pull out of that hole. Sorry. Um, and uh, it's a deep fun hole, but right. um, let's pull back to ba the basic, like the basic political theory. Yeah. So what you're looking at here is basically when you look at democracy as a form of government, basically where power is actually broadly spread across the population and power in the sense that the population is constantly sort of making actual choices like yeah. any actual power figure who's not symbolic as, like yeah. you know let's execute socrates would be an example of like a democratic right. decision right you know and so literally they executed the greatest philosopher in history based on an internet poll okay that's right. democracy right so you know more generally the equation of democracy and politics is interesting this is something you can find people uttering the same rhetoric in the um, early 20th century where they basically condemn. You'll notice that in the English political language as it stands, the word politics has a negative connotation. If you're politicizing anything, you're going to politicize U.S. foreign policy. It's very bad. 
But democracy has a positive connection. Right. Right. So what gives, right? right. You know, and, and it's like, then you're like, basically you look around the world and you notice, you know, weird anomalous things. Like, for example, you ever heard of North Korea? Like, do you know the official name of North times. Korea? What's the official name of North Korea? I don't know. It's the DPRK. It stands for the right. Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So that's one place right. name and three synonyms for democracy. Yeah, sounds so good. So basically yeah. what democratic means today is just legitimate in some abstract sense. Right. And so, you know, basically that's how like the European Commission, which is basically about as accountable to like the like voters of Europe as like Kim Jong-un is to like my right. aunt. Right. right. You know, right. Um, um, is basically represents democratic democracy and like civil society. That's another euphemism for oligarchy that you'll hear, um, you know, um, um, respected institutions, how are they right. respected? You know, it's like if you go to Wikipedia, Wikipedia has the policy of reliable sources, which are prestigious institutions. Yeah. And like ostensibly that's sort of an objective like thing in a way. But if you go to like the page for that and, you know, with a question like what is a reliable source? Uh, basically, what you'll find is that a reliable source is a source yeah. uh, that is reliable. Is, um, it, and, are, are these consolidations? And, are these consolidations of of power and influence among elites inevitable? In they are inevitable in an oligarchy, okay. and so basically, they're sort of an inevitable part of oligarchical governance. What happens? And so in the a way monarchy, the way yeah. the way they evolved, which yeah. is sort of useful to know, is that. Basically, if you look at the U.S., this is like short, simple U.S. political history as like quickly as I can give it. So basically, in the 1890s, the U.S. is in what's called the Gilded Age. Um, and um, power in that age is sort of relatively decentralized, and it's kind of in the hands of sort of corrupt po politicians who are easily bribed by like large companies and it's the Gilded Age, it's the robber barons, sort of all these stereotypes are basically kind of true. Um, and government is basically, you know, the effect is like China. Like you'll notice there's a lot of shit that was built then. They seem to have been able to do things very, very quickly. Uh, they also Empire seem to, State Building, 12 em, months. Empire yeah. fucking State Building is like, you know, being built months, faster yeah. than like my friend's like vacation house. Like right. there's like, there's some, right. there's like some kind of capacity in that, in that society that has vanished. It's also like very corrupt, which no one thinks is a good thing. And like, there's just, it's like fucked in a lot of ways. Right. And the thing is that um, the power is not in the hands of, the sort of most socially dominant classes at the time. Power is not in the hands of the smartest people. The idea of a professor telling what the government, the government what to do would be like having like a, you know, programmer tell the government what to do. It would be like, right. what? Like why? It would be why? insane. It would be insane, right? right? And, and the thing is, but basically there's a kind of, um, a sort of like a thermal inversion of power whenever like the best and the smartest people are not the people running the show. And so the old intellectual classes, sort of where this movement starts in America, at least in Britain, it's the Fabians. In America, it's the Mugwumps, the literal liberal Republicans, people like Charles Francis Adams Jr., who's like one of my favorite writers ever, his brother Henry Adams, who wrote The Education of Henry Adams. They're kind of doyens of this very aristocratic. Imagine if like, you know, um, um, you know, David Foster Wallace was right. also a Kennedy, right? Gotcha. You know, like that's like the level of status that right. these motherfuckers have. They were blue right. bloods. Total blue bloods. Yeah. Right. You know, and very sophisticated and also the best intellectuals of their time. Right. Right. Adams is the editor of the North American Review, which is like the New Yorker of its time right. or rather the Vanity Fair of its time. And <laughs> I'm <Right>. sorry. <laughs> and, um, the, um, and, and, um, and so, Basically, you have the intellectual elites who are realizing the power of like science and thought who are like at the head of this revolution. And then they look at the most important function in the world, government, and it's being run by these like corrupt, like boss tweed motherfuckers and right. just like fucking Irishmen. I, I mean, Italians, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and like people of just like no class and civilization, right? You know, and who are stealing, who are in right. fact corrupt and who have no vision whatsoever and are just like letting shit happen. And why did the... Empire State bit gilding, you know, um, you know, get built in 12 months because like, you know, some WAP made a million right. dollars on the permits. Right. You right. know, and, and right. they're just like, this is unacceptable. Right. Like, this is not a way we can live. Right. right. And so basically 
that turns into this philosophy of like contempt for politics and politicians and the idea that this should be this sort of cosmetic process and then real policy should be made by experts. And so experts who are people who have university who now educations. Can't, we can't build any affordable right. housing And so basically at all. Yeah. here's here's like the biggest mistake in a way that was made with this to, you know when you go sort of very very far back they're like okay democracy doesn't work democracy doesn't work because the, basically the people will just have their votes stolen by these like clowns the people do not vote for philosopher kings they do not like philosopher kings they vote for like thieves and clowns it's like, imagine, you know, think about elections and some. Oh, what like, about George W. Bush? Think about elections and some, you know, yeah. America at the right. time, you got to remember, America at the time is, is a third world country. It's That's a right. rising third world country. That's like, right. And so you're like, basically, you know, let's think about a random third world country. Let's say Paraguay. Do you know anything about Paraguay? Not a ton. Do you think the citizens of Paraguay are entitled to, you know, are actually capable of like devising the right policies for the future of Paraguay? Not at this time. And not, not at this right. time. That is an excellent answer. Not, not at, at this, this time. time. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, that leaves the possibility, okay, that leaves open the possibility that the citizens of Paraguay could be educated, you know, their brains could be extended with additional lobes, you know, they could become like citizen philosophers like the citizens of Athens who executed Socrates, you know, right? right? I'm not saying this couldn't work. And, you know, one of the things you see is that as systems become smaller and more like democracy at Burning Man, it's not a democracy, but you could imagine it being a democracy. It would still probably be fucked. Right. But like, you know, currently it's some kind of oligarchy or, you know, yes. it's a complete autocratic despotism. Yes. Right. You know, uh, you could imagine it um, as a democracy and maybe that would not be fucked. Right. But if you try to imagine, say, um, let's make, say, since we mentioned it, Detroit is going to be yes. democracy. Yes. And then the citizens of Detroit will elect a king of Detroit who is actually has absolute an emperor of Detroit who has absolute power over Detroit. Right. You know, are they going to like or that? No, even better. Let's say direct democracy. They will decide the laws of Detroit themselves and they will execute people by Internet polls that like work if you're only geolocated to Detroit, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. The, the, uh, you know, I like you're just imagining an insane. So shit no one, did anyone so, ever believe in democracy? Um, so democracy, basically, you know, if it's funny, if you go to the Wikipedia page on Athenian democracy, right. there's an interesting line from a modern scholar, yeah. which is like, you know, it's interesting that so many cultures have tried to copy this system of government. And all we have, all the writing, all the writing from its own period was just like, this was the worst shit show ever devised. Right. You know? And right. so even in kind of this best case scenario, basically, like what you're seeing is like it had a really checkered reputation and it was considered basically, you know, between, you know, uh, until essentially the like 18th or maybe even early 19th century, it's generally considered a slur. It's like saying fascism or communism, right? It's basically democracy is like mob rule and everyone knows that's bad. And so it was, you know, then... Right. It's and even of, in school, when we were being taught about democracy, yeah. they would they would always say we are a republic. Right. Because we don't want mob rule. Right. And, yes. and, and, and yeah. so and that was what that reflects is basically the original foundation of the Constitution, which is basically the Constitution is a right wing coup. And it's a right wing coup because the Articles of Confederation, which are much more democratic and much more Rob Ruley, Mob Ruley, and much more Jacobin, as they would have said in those days, because right. remember the fucking French Revolution is fucking going down. That's right. Right, you know, and yeah. it's a fucking shit show. And like Thomas Jefferson is over there basically being like the Jane Fonda of the French Revolution, right? You know, and he's he's like, oh yeah, you know, we gotta kill some aristocrats, you know, the blood right. of the, you know, the the, the tree right. of liberty, right? You know, right. um, you know, Thomas Paine is even worse. Thomas Paine basically goes over there and he's like those Americans who like went to China and like yeah. It with Mao, right. you know, and, um, um, yeah. you know, um, he, he gets so into French politics, he gets himself in fucking trouble. Right. You know, and um, so the Americans of who created the Constitution, notice that you don't know anything about the Articles of Confederation period, except that it happened. Interesting. And yeah. complete historical blackout. It's a complete, you don't even names of the people involved, no. events, 13 years of American history, right? You know, like counting the, the like, I mean, the cons, it has continuity with the whole revolution. There's right. a Congress during that whole period, right? It's an utter shit show. And um, states are like almost going to war with each other. Like Rhode Island basically has to almost be convinced to join the Constitution by a fuck 
get them blockade, right? right? You know, right. Um, crazy ass shit, right? You know, and I mean, crazy ass shit goes like American history before the revolution is like, that's a period of like over 150 years. You've never heard of like Liza Lerz rebellion and shit, like insane, the regulator war, never heard of it, no. right? You know, insane historical blackout shit just because no, I was, I was, anyway. I, I'm a public school kid, literally history started with Lizzo. Yeah. History started with Lizzo. Yeah. So basically the constitution, you know, um, which they did mention a couple of times, yeah. you know, as like, it was, you know, printed, but printed by God, you know, as they say in Utah and, um, the constitution is a right wing coup. Right. That basically intends to install this like dual, very Silicon Valley structure. It's like, you know, um, uh, Eric Schmidt so and, by and Larry Page. Yeah. And no, no. What it's okay. actually installing is basically a monarchy Right. With George Washington as the like figurative monarch and Alexander Hamilton as like the startup CEO dude who actually does everything. Right. 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 And Alexander Hamilton, by the way, was a black man. Let's just go with let's don't 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 quest don't no oh, 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 stay off the fucking internet. Don't go stay on off Google. the fucking internet. You'll be fired. Alexander Hamilton was a black man. Okay. He may not have been a black man, but how much do you like your job? Alexander right. Hamilton was a black man. Is that what and, this is that it, really the going thing now? And I, and I, okay. No, it will be. Okay. Uh, you know, Alexander Hamilton <laughs> Alexander <laughs> Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An African American gentleman. Yes. Was the first king of America. Okay. And so, you know, basically he is running the US government like a startup. Right. He's completely in charge of it. He's like fucking Elon Musk. And nominally he's the secretary of the treasury. Jefferson is the secretary of state. He's just like this Hamilton motherfucker is running everything. Right. What the fuck? Right. You know, right. of course he is because he's basically Thomas Jefferson is a wonderful eccentric guy, just kind of a blowhard. Right. And like Hamilton actually knows he's how to get shit done. He's getting things done. Yeah. He's getting shit done. Right. And um, so if you look basically at American history, it's again, pulling the camera way the fuck back. It's this the constitution is this really cool design because it basically has structures that are designed to be stand-ins for sort of all three forms. Originally it was designed for the set for the house to be very democratic, which is why like the mob power. Now, of course the house has a 98% incumbency, you know, rate right, and seniority right. rules that were basically appear to have been copied from the most serene Republic of Venice. Right. And so it's this amazing bulwark against democracy, um, and it creates like the Nancy Pelosi's of the world that, you right. know, make, make, um, you know, uh, the Supreme Soviet look like the Baltimore Orioles, but right. you know, the, the, um, in any case, <laughs> um, the original design is like, you take all three forces in government, the force of democracy, the force of, um, absolute power. Ar aristocracy right. in the Senate, the Senate was supposed to be right. aristocratic. And it was for a while before like the 15th, whatever, whatever the gas amendment, the directional yeah. direct election of senators. And, um, the, um, and then the presidency was the focus of monarchy. Right. And this, the Supreme Court was originally supposed to just be a, like a digital organ. But again, that's another structure of, of oligarchy. And that's a very, very low frequency oligarchy. Right. Which has very slow turnover. Right. And then the like power dynamic between all of these institutions is left entirely unspecified. This is how basically, in a way, it's sort of Hamiltonian government is like killed with Marbury versus Madison, which you probably read about in public yes. school, where the Supreme Court is like, no, actually, I read the Constitution and it doesn't say this, but they meant we're in charge. Right. right. You know, and so what's neat about this system and what has made it like survive a lot of crises that really probably should have killed it is that basically about every 75 or 80 years, you have a regime change in the United States. You have a replacement of like the whole actual structural forces of government under the same name, which is a very common thing in history. Um, and it leads Explain, to like go, go into this more. And it leads yeah. to like a different structure of forces. So basic and and it centers around a president who is actually a monarch. Not in that they call themselves king. As you know, the right. Roman Emperor is never called FDR, Valerian didn't call FDR himself. FDR is an example of FDR this. FDR is an example, and who else? Lincoln. Lincoln. There right. you go. So basically what you have in all three cases is you have basically this startup regime. And this startup regime in Lincoln's case, one of the interesting things about Lincoln from a Silicon Valley, I'm just going to start saying Silicon Valley. Yeah, like, you it know, sounds like, better. It sounds better, right? You know, and it has all these like salacious overtones. Yes. You know, and, and um, <laughs> you know, one of these Silicon Valley things is that you look at the Lincoln administration 
And you notice that the Lincoln administration is run by this like weirdo, self-educated, wild, genius political talent, Abraham Lincoln, really the first great American politician. Um, and some might say Jackson, some might say Van Buren. Like Lincoln is like a combination of Jackson and Van Buren, right. you know, and he's like a Machiavellian genius and he's also like a genius orator. And he really convinces people to this day, like think that Lincoln had like some kind of like philosophy. Lincoln's philosophy was whatever's good for Abraham Lincoln. And, um, you know, and he was a master politician. And basically, um, FDR's philosophy is also whatever is good for FDR. I think, I want to think Washington and Hamilton are like pure. Right. Um, but the thing is, even with this level of like, you know, I don't really approve of Lincoln and FDR. I don't approve of a lot of things that went on in their regimes. Um, however, one notices a couple of things about them. One is that basically, if you look, for example, at the Lincoln administration, you'll see that a lot of it, the government that Lincoln controls, mainly focusing on the war effort, is controlled by these young 20-something guys, uh, Nicolay and Hay. Hay uh, later becomes the Secretary of State in like the McKinley administration. And you're just like, aha, I see an organization run absolutely from the top down by a pair of guys in their 20s. Right. Where have I fucking seen this before? Right. You know? Facebook. Yeah. And, and, right. and where have I fucking seen this before? Yeah. And they win. Right. You know, right. and um, they win because they're awesome. And then you basically see that these regimes are created as this monar these monarchical structures. Then kind of central power kind of decays and they become oligarchies. And it's like once there were like wires going up to the wheelhouse and the wires are cut. Why does central power decay? It's central power decays because... Everything, you know, it's like, that's, that's why asking why do people die? People all right. die for a different reason. They die right. in different ways. Let's skip right. forward to the FDR regime. So the FDR regime is this quintessence of this like university driven revolution because you were the universities 400 years ago for the fucking, for the fucking upper class. They're for, from, you know, for the, like the 500 families, like the people that actually matter in this country, right. like, and, um, the, you know, this is a revolution of the university class. FDR himself personally, like Lincoln, I guess, is not really a manager. FDR is actually in some ways a lot like Trump. He's a very vain person. He's quite intelligent. He's like not really into books. He's like totally dominates a room when he comes into it. He's like the most charming person in the world, very shallow. But there's a huge difference between FDR and Trump, which is that FDR is from a super, like one of the most aristocratic American families. Roosevelt's, he's, yeah. The Roosevelt's, he has huge confidence and he knows how to delegate. Because every time Trump tries to delegate, he's, he's like, can I trust this person? Right. What if he's trying to become bigger than me? You know, what if right. Steve Bannon is trying to exceed me? And like, right. he's like the worst fucking, you know, anyway, I don't say, want to say, I hate big saying bad things yeah. about people, even if they're Donald Trump. Right. Um, you know, I think Donald Trump would make an excellent chairman of the board. And that is the right job for him. He should be promoted. It's a promotion. It's a more important job being chairman of the board than being CEO. And right. so, Donald, if you're listening, you know, stay off of Urbit, but... Um, also, <laughs> oh, he's going on Urbit. <laughs> he's on his way to Urbit. Stay right off of now. Urbit yeah. and start thinking of yourself as like the like well, CEO so, so you, emeritus. You, and you've made so, this point. So anyway, yeah. so getting back to FDR and like this is sort of the birth of what we call the deep state. Right. Originally a Turkish word, I think first popularized by my friend Steve Saylor and um, Peter Dale Scott had deep politics. Maybe. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. It's close. This is the it's same close. basic thing. Yeah. Right. You know, um, you know, Scott was very familiar with like the sort of you know, foreign, you know, like the aid industrial complex, sure. you know, which my father worked for, you know, and the whole foreign policy insanity. Apparatus, right? yeah. Yeah, the whole apparatus, you know, yeah. that's just one arm of this deep state that was created by trusting the experts, right? You know, nobody even knows what it's fucking for anymore. Right. Right. Nobody even knows what it's fucking for. And um, people just like make up reasons, like we got to predict all the viruses, right? You know, right. that is the level of like top level geostrategic thinking and U.S. foreign policy is at the level of let's collect all the viruses, right? right. Um, you know, but going back to sort of the, the, you know, the birth of this system, like there's a couple of things that I say to describe like the New Deal and the New Deal era. Um, one is I was particularly struck by a book in Theodore White's Making of the President in 1960, a very famous political book in which he's talking to one of the Kennedy people or one of the older people who's kind of involved in like the new frontier. And we th when we think about the new frontier, we think about the Kennedy world. And there's this kind of edge of monarchy to like Kennedy world because this is a big family. And right, 
you know, Roosevelt had kids as well, but they were just like incredibly corrupt, incompetent fucks. Right. And there was no way to take them seriously as politicians, you know, unlike, say, Teddy Kennedy. Right. Maybe it was a more serious time as well. But the thing is, you see all of these monarchical complex complexes developing. Right. And so you see that when you have someone like FDR, who I encourage like all of my fans, but especially the libs to think of when they think of as of monarchy, when you see someone like FDR, basically like, you know, and you see that, OK, he's not technically a hereditary monarch, but like the sort of attributes of hereditary monarchy that are like hereditary succession start forming as they have formed for thousands of years throughout human history. So like, you know, you start to, from this perspective, you start to lose your kind of temporal exceptionalism. You're like, history isn't ending at all. And like government is kind of the same thing it's always been. Right. Right. And, and you know, if government is the same thing it's always been, it's easy to look at FDR's world and see a couple of different things. One is, remember I was talking, there was a guy like T.H. White. Um, T. E. White, something I forget his name. Um, author of Making the President, uh, Making the President, nineteen sixty, is um, um, yes, yeah, um, is Theodore is Ryan talking White. to someone yeah. who remembers the New Deal era, and um, he's um, basically in the New Frontier Act. And when we think of like the New Frontier in Camelot, this is like the most exciting time ever. This is like right. my God, like being a frontiersman, like, yes. you know, like, you know, Kennedy has Robert Frost read it as inauguration. Biden has Amanda Gorman. Right. One of these things is maybe not quite like the other, right. you know, like, right. and so you have this right. like, you know, excellence right yeah. at the, at the, at the top and the sense of like heredity sort of forming. And you're just like, what is this, what is this like Kennedy cult of the Kennedys have to do with like the American revolution? Right. You right. know? And, um, and so you're seeing all these things develop. Those things are way more intense in the Roosevelt era. This guy who remembers the new deal is like, Oh yeah, you know, everything seems kind of dull and drab in the new frontier to anyone who remembers the new deal. That's how, like how much fucking startup energy the new deal had. It's like working right. at Google in 2003. Right. Basically, you know, here is, you know, let's say you graduate from Harvard in like 1936 versus 2016. If you graduate from Harvard in 1936 with a degree in this new field of economics, a field that has basically been completely reinvented in the last 20 years, um, you're like, oh, you know, I'm a Harvard man. I'm really smart. And I know somebody who knows somebody who knows Tommy Corcoran, or Felix Frankfurter or someone like that. And somebody calls somebody and I get a phone call and they're like, would you like to come to DC? Yeah. You're, and yeah. Con you know, concealing your excitement. You're like, sure. Okay. I'm not doing anything, yeah. anything else this time of year. And you come to, and, and, but what would I be doing? And, um, you know, the, the voice on the phone is like, we don't know. And it doesn't matter. Come to DC. Right. And you come to D.C. and somebody puts you in an office and is like, OK, your job is to go. Here's five million dollars. Your job is to go electrify Arkansas. Like, you know, that's the New right. Deal experience. That's right. a fucking startup experience. And yeah. you're like 21. Right. And you're like, OK. And you get it fucking done in like nine months. Yeah. Right. And, and like that is what created the enormous faith in like the powers of the U.S. government that people had at that time. It actually the New Deal actually got shit done. And um ever driven on route one that's yeah, a new deal project of course imagine that happening now no. imagine you know yeah. right it is the laugh right you know right. and so it's this amazingly effective thing it's full of the best people in society um and it's like incredibly dynamic it gives you incredible levels of like personal responsibility at incredibly young ages now imagine you graduate from harvard in 2016 with a degree in economics you're like, okay, I'm going to apply for an unpaid internship on the Hill. So they pay right. their interns. I don't know. They make a dick, right? You know, yeah. uh, in any case, you really should have family that can help you out because you got to spend $1,300 right. on a room the size of a shoebox. And then you're right. on somebody's staff and you're answering letters from Pork Pie, Iowa. Yeah. And then, you know, like, do they ever write? Then, you know, even when you, after 20 years, you're not even writing legislation. Certainly the senators, like the, you know, the congressmen never write any legislation. They barely look at it. They pass these bills that haven't even read. The staff doesn't even write the legislation. They get, they collect, they edit the legislation. They get lines from like lobbyists and activists which are the kind of two real sides of Congress. Right. And you're just like, this is like this insane thing. And like, as a young person, there's just no like joy in it. 
So as a young person, your mind naturally turns after 75 or 80 years. And by the way, let me finish, finish explaining what happens at the top. So FDR is a, not a brilliant manager. He's a brilliant collector of talents. He's like more like Peter Thiel than Elon Musk. Right. And so he basically collects these entire talents at the head of these or this organization um, and does all these like completely unethical things about World War II. I always recommend Nicholson Baker's book, Human Smoke. Um, it's sort of one of the few, it, it sort of gives you the right mood of World War II, which is not a Marvel movie. Right. Um, and, right. um, that's, you know, as much as I yeah. want to, it is yeah. not a yeah. Marvel movie, no. right? You know, and, and, and so FDR in 44 realizes that he's dying. Anyone who's in the know knows he's dying. Remember the fucking people out there are so brainwashed by the cathedral of that time. They don't even know he's paralyzed. Interesting. They don't even know he's That's right. They That's don't even point. know he's yeah. fucking paralyzed. They don't even know he's had like a private subway station in New York built right. for like, you know, it's like this is a level at which like if you look at the distance at the level, how easy it is to like contain the truth from the perspective of the media yeah. at that time, it's just like this. Amazing. Right. You know, it's amazing, right? You know, it's Orwellian. Like Orwell worked for the BBC. Right. right? He knew this, right? You know, and so or um Roosevelt in forty four, he's dying. He knows he's dying. Everybody who's in the know knows he's dying. The public is informed that he's in the best of health, fit as a fiddle. Right. And anyone who looks at him can see he's dying. And so his previous, um, you know, vice president has been Henry Wallace. Now, one thing to understand about the 30s, which was sometimes called the Red Decade, is that in the 30s, everyone who was cool was a, a communist. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, just read a book by Eugene Lyons called The Red Decade, and you'll see that clearly. A communist or a communist sympathizer. My grandparents were actually communists. Right. This is a non-debatable historical fact. Right. So, uh, you know, but basically the communists are at this time, they're selling like one or two percent of the population. If you look at the people who voted for the same guy, Henry Wallace in 48, when he ran on the progressive party ticket, note that word progressive. Yeah. Uh, that's also what my grandparents called themselves. In fact, they were card carrying communists. Right. Um, you've heard that word somewhere else, progressive, right? Yes. Um, and uh, it's meaning has never changed. It's right. just like most people who call themselves progressives don't even know the history of the word. Right. They're like those people in like New Mexico who still practice like the Jewish rituals, you know, but don't right. even know they're Jews, you know? Um, and, um, but that's where, you know, the, like even cancellation, that's a, yeah. that's a communist practice that comes right. from an internal, like, like internal, if you read a book called the romance of American communism, there are all these like cancellation memoirs from like the fifties, right. right. From inside the party. Yes. Um, and so anyway, but FDR realizes that he intends to found a regime. He intends to found something that is his that will last for many years, certainly into the 2020s, after him. And therefore, America must no longer be a monarchy. What must happen is that basically all of these bright, amazing people, like the best and the brightest, right? You know, in the 60s, it's still kind of the best and the brightest. You can use that without like joking. Like nobody, nobody would describe like right. Susan Rice as the best and the brightest, right? You know, and um, I, she's not dumb, right? right. Um, um, you know, actually her son is like a famous based Stanford person. Yeah. Um, Susan Rice is not dumb. Uh, this is public. Um, right. And Susan Rice is not dumb. Um, For sure she's not dumb. She's not dumb but she's not fucking um, Dean Acheson. Correct. John Bolton is also not Dean Acheson. You know, I read fucking John Bolton's book and he's like, basically, he's like, I am the second coming of Dean Acheson. Yeah, he's like, not. Like, we have the same muscles. He's, he's not. not. Yeah, okay, Dean okay. Acheson avoided wars. Yeah, ex well, you know, you <laughs> Slightly. Can, I can say some things about Dean Acheson. Sure. But, you know, but I mean, and, John Bolton loves uh, yeah, he yeah, loves yeah, a yeah, good... Yeah, yeah, yeah. In any case, basically, like, these are pygmies, right? right. You know, and, and so, you know, what you see is basically FDR does this baryonic thing where as a successor and vice president in 1944 he picks harry truman and who the fuck is harry truman harry truman is a nobody so what and like he's a nobody of like very limited intelligence very limited he's not really prominent he's a member of like the pendergast boss faction he's not even a progressive democrat he's not even a new dealer right and so basically by, by picking someone who's not even a new dealer, which is a master stroke. It was FDR's finest stroke because he's basically saying, who is going to succeed me? The answer is a nobody. Right. And it's immediately reminiscent of Alexander the Great when he was dying. 
I don't know if this story is true. It's a story I've read. It's a cool story. He's dying, and all of his like henchmen, he's uh, like 30 or something, all of his henchmen are gathered around him, and they're like, who shall inherit the empire of Alexander? Who shall be the next, you know, who shall the kingdom go to? Who shall the empire go to? And his last two words are tokratos, which means to the strongest. Ah, <laughs> and so you know, almost these these people almost like figurative, like like pull out their fucking swords right. in like the funeral room, right? Right, you know. And so, but FDR is doing something less slightly different by saying power should go to nobody. He ensures that Harry Truman does not have the gravitas or power to actually command the deep state. That's right. And so he basically lets the deep state command him and give him little teleprompter scripts to read. He's not like demented and he doesn't start reading the directions on the teleprompter, right. but he basically is like inaugurates the era of the kind of semi figurehead president president and power has a va you know, since he's and by the time you here, get to Eisenhower, Eisenhower is openly saying, yeah, yeah, I don't really know what goes on. I don't even, I don't really yeah. know what goes he, on. Right. And yeah. since then Nixon <laughs> does this thing, Nixon yes. does this thing where he's like, no, I will really be the president and try to regain command of the at, bureaucracy. Yeah, good luck with this that. This is the way Bolton and Barr also think. Right. Bolton and Barr, also have this thing of like, let's actually try to, we're the grownups in the room. We will actually make the U.S. government work. No, you won't, you fucks. Right. You know, and right. like, go like shave your mustache and retire, right? You yeah. know, and and so um, that basically sort of brings us to the like political structure of today. That's how we got to the oligarchy we're in today. If right. you pull back from that story of like where the deep state is the new deal. It is right. the personal regime of FDR Without and the, the new deal, of FDR. the new deal comes into play. All of the people, the architects of the new deal, become the heads of all these institutions. Yeah. Yeah. all of these institutions are now more powerful than Harry the Truman. Great foundations, right? The great foundations, Carnegie, Far, you know, That's like Carnegie, right. Rockefeller, Ford. There's yes. a whole philanthropic industrial and complex, all of these young, and they all right. have exactly the same fucking ideas. And these yes. ideas are like dumber than a post and smell like shit. Does this? Does this structure work at all? Does it work no, at no, all? No, no, it has to be completely ripped out. Yes. And here is basically the problem is that it has to be completely ripped out. And the only sort of form of government that can rip it out is the same form of government that the U.S. goes through every 75 or 80 years. Which, which, is, a which monarchy. is a monarchy. Which is basically. And so. Is the worry because a lot of people that say that read your work and say it's very interesting. But they go the people that really also seem to like it are people that love or seem to flirt with the idea of theocracy. So, so yeah. So, you know, it's funny you should use the word theocracy, right. Tim, you know, yes. because have you ever seen signs on people's lawns that tell you what to think? Yeah. Uh, well, no, 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 for you sure. Know, like, and that's, and, it, that's and, another and, kind of theocracy. And, and so, yeah, yeah. So, so, so in a way it's like, it's an interesting point because in a sense, like, you conclude when looking at history that sort of the libertarian kind of freedom of speech world has never exactly been a thing. Right. And so your question of how to sort of do something like that is like basically what you have to realize is that most human beings will sort of always believe what they're taught to think. Right. And therefore control of what they're taught to think is sort of always in the hands right. of someone and it should be in the hands of someone responsible who has no need to tell anything but the truth, who right. has an incentive to tell the truth. And because that's not that's not the religious right, and it's not the no, woke, no, it's, it's not goes, the woke goes, left. It, no, it's it's no one. It's like basically. It's, and here's the thing, yeah. uh, you know, you get into like this like culture war like bullshit. Like okay, right. like and and I'm just like I have less and less patience. I'm sorry, I have yeah. less and less patience Agreed. for this shit. Yeah, right. You know, and um, when we go back to like Roman history. You know, and one of the things we see in, again, pulling the camera way the fuck back on the history of the Roman Republic, what we see is that for like 400 years, there's something called the conflict of the orders. And at first it's patricians versus plebeians. Later, I'm going to butcher the Latin. It's um, optimates versus populares. Optimates, it's basically, uh, you know, optimates are the aristocracy, the blue right. state. Populares are the red state, you right. know. Uh, the populace, right? You know, and so even now you can you can just sort of discern right and left. And so in the late Roman Republic, basically this political conflict degenerates into actual civil war because these people had like 
well, they had like balls, they had like normal testosterone levels. Right. They like knew how to like fight and right. kill each other. And they were like normal human beings. They right? also didn't have Postmates. Yeah, they also didn't have Postmates, they right? Nor DoorDash. All the things. They didn't also DoorDash, Uber, right? You yeah. know, life was a lot harder. They it were a lot harder. tougher. Yeah. You know, we can go into the whole anti-technology sure. thing. This is getting a little long, so maybe in a, maybe yeah. in a different episode. Yes. Um, but um, um, I, I hope you're having fun. But, no, I'm, uh, I'm a, listen, this is fascinating Amazing stuff. All right, and all right. You drew it really. All right, all right. Truly. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna run out of steam soon. Uh, my caffeine yeah, is gonna wear you, off. You, you're but sure. uh, let me. So so let me talk, and your brain is probably full. Um, which no, is, I mean, it's it's it is full, but it's 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 really yeah. this is really interesting stuff. And again, the the I think the let me, yeah. yeah. Let yeah. me let me yeah. let me finish. Let me finish with a little bit of Roman political science. Okay. And let's, we'll get off of political science and we can have a little chill yes. area, you know, when we talk about right. sports or right. something. Yeah. You know, um, and, um, you know, because you're probably an Islanders fan. Are you an Islanders fan? I don't care. Okay. I mean, I, yeah. I've left Long Island. That's fine. That's fine. I have Beverly Hills. I, you know, I'm Persian now. I'm if a Persian. You, if you, the way, I'm an Arab. If the way, the way, if you want to like get, as I call it, like clear pill. Yes. The way to basically get your head out of this culture war bullshit is to take that attitude toward the Islanders yes. and apply it to the Republicans and the Democrats. That's right. I, it I agree with you. It is incredibly refreshing and it will leave a chunk of neurons in your head that is the size of a That's fucking right. baseball free to think about other things. That's right. Okay. So, um, um, you know, and... Um, and there are many, like, I'm not even saying don't think about political science. I'm saying take a break yeah. from thinking about political science yeah. And um, you'll have that baseball free. And then maybe yes. that baseball can come back with like Aristotle and James Burnham and stuff. But just let it rest. Right. Let it chill out. Let it become like 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 soft, like Kobe beef. Yes. OK, so, you know, um, um, the because um, it needs a fucking break after these last few years, oh, for sure. you know, and, and in any case, in Rome, you had, um, you know, the conflict of the orders, you know, in like 80, 90 BC or whatever, it becomes a civil war. And it becomes a civil war between these two tyrants, Marius and Sulla, who are kind of the Hitler and Stalin of the ancient Roman world. And they're the Hitler and the Stalin of the ancient Roman world because they sort of, they are monarchs and they rule as monarchs, as effectively kings. But even when they become de facto, and they never claim the title of king, the Caesars never did, right? And rex, which means king, is never used you know, by you know, the emperors. Imperator just means commander. Uh, in any case, both of these cats, um, you know, are um, they're they're leading a faction in the civil war, and when their faction wins and dominates all of Rome, they basically govern from one side. So when you're talking about like the religious right, you know, or the woke left, and you're imagining a imagining a dictator who really believes all of these things with like the power of the religious right and the woke left, the religious right, you know, as Michael Anton calls it, the red Caesar comes to power, you know, and he's basically like, um, bans birth control and then right. the woke left, you know, comes to power and basically makes everyone gay. Makes men take you know, birth control. Makes men take, exactly. Right. Makes men take birth yes. control. Yes. Fucking genius comedic right. line. Uh, you know, and um, <laughs> makes men take birth control. And you're just like, no, right. And so, you know, what each of these individuals specifically in do is when they come to power, they do this thing that's called proscription. That's like prescription, like your ad oral prescription, but with an O. And what proscription means is that basically you take your prominent enemies, you kill them, and you give them money to your friends. So imagine right. if like Donald Trump is like, now we're going to execute Steve Bannon and like we're going to give the money. Uh, you know, we're going to execute, sorry, George Soros, and we're right. going to give the money to like Steve Bannon and his friends. Right. Right. And then, you know, um, then Barack Obama, you know, after being like chased through the swamps, the stories of these individuals are incredible. Barack Obama takes right. power and he's like, now we're going to take all of Peter Thiel's money and, give it to Susan and we're going to give it to the underprivileged, right. you know, and also to George Soros. Right. You know, right. <laughs> um, and also right. the underprivileged, yeah. but as well, like right. George Soros. Right. You know, and, um, you know, of course, by far, I'm sure you know this, by far, most billionaires and especially old money is blue. Um, yes. and, and the, um, but it's not, retarded. Not all of them. Not all of it, yeah. but most of it, right? You know, and in, in the, the size of like, you know, progressive philanthropy as compared to the size of conservative philanthropy, 
is like comparing a Burger King to In and Out Burger. Right. Um, and but I also think the definition of blue has changed because yeah. if you look at the military industrial complex, sure. some of those people are they're identifying even, as blue, but yeah, it's even not that, that the blue, blue is seeping. Yeah, it's no I longer. I mean, Hillary Clinton doesn't no feel the blue. Of, it's no longer. She doesn't feel blue to me. I mean, I know she's blue. Yeah, it depends. Yeah. It's no longer the age of General Jack D. Ripper. That's true. Right. Right. You know. Um. And so, in any case, basically, like these civil wars are like a very bloody time, right? And so, you know, you have this reaction to these civil wars like Sula wins in the end and he's like I am Sula I will restore the republic but he can't really restore the republic because the republic at a certain level you know it's like Paraguay right not at this time not right? at this time <laughs> not at this time we'll right and so it. Yeah. you know the only question is sort of who's basically going to rule and I have two stories about that one is um Caesar and Augustus the Caesars basically sort of find this kind of different pattern which works. They're not red or blue. They're, this is the most unoriginal metaphor ever. They're purple. And they're purple not in that they're centrists and that they want to diffuse power between both of these groups. Oh no, they're monarchs. Right. But they're purple monarchs. They're not, there is no red Caesar. Red Caesar is Marius, blue Caesar is Sulla. Right. But Caesar is purple Caesar, which is also, of course, the color of, of empire. Right. Um, as well as, you know, traditionally associated with homosexuality. And many right. of these emperors were gay. Right. Um, and um, in fact, what's called, I have this other theory that's what's called the five good emperors. Yeah. It was actually this like sort of little in gay ring that was going on. Uh, um, and so we need a gay We need a gay Caesar. To kill right. People. I'm like, some say okay. we need a red. In fact, yeah. Tim, Tim, I'm not. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, you know, some yeah. say we need a red Caesar. Some say we need a blue Caesar. Yeah. It's possible that following the example yeah. of, you know, yeah. Pius Antoninus, what we really need is a gay uh, Caesar. But okay. um, the. Um, um, but also Hitler was gay. But um, yeah. uh, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But Hitler right. was gay. But um, um, in any case, um, sort of. It's going to disappoint so many of his fans. <laughs> <laughs> what I know, I know. I, I yeah. actually had this argument yeah. on a podcast with like a real white nationalist podcaster. And, yeah. you know, uh, like some people were very mad about this gay Hitler yes. thing. Uh, you know, I think it's very. Uh, libs could be mad about it, too. Sure. I think it's very clear. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and, you know, if a major leader is not surrounded by like woman that he's like banging. Right. Like, there's a reason for that. For like, sure. What is the most obvious reason for that? Right. What about American recent American president? Never mind. Uh, yeah. You know, in any case, I don't know. I don't want to go there. But, um, yeah. you know, in any case, um, the um, so Caesar, here's this anecdote about Caesar. Caesar is, is comes from the popularis. Yeah. He starts as a, he starts as a red state politician. Imagine him as like DeSantis, also a military man. Right. Um, and he's basically like fights in the civil wars. I'm not saying DeSantis is as cool as Caesar. That's a right. ridiculous comparison. Of course. Um, you know, but um, the, uh, I mean, Caesar is also a great literary man, you know. Right. Like he writes the best prose of his age. Um, he fucks. Right. Um, you know, like um, a lot of amazing things about Caesar. Um, but um, the most amazing thing in some ways about Caesar is what he does when he wins the Civil War. Right. So there's this incident after, I forget the name of the battle, a battle in Africa, there's this incident, and the last senatorial force in office is led by Cato. And Cato is like the Bernie Sanders of his time. He's like completely authentic. Everybody respects Cato. Everybody knows that Cato's spirit is the spirit of the old republic. But the right. thing is, the old republic, you know, it's like Senator Palpatine said, the old republic doesn't work anymore. Right. You know, and it just doesn't. You know, and I'm sorry, but it doesn't. And that will be the, the subject of my next story. Um, it just doesn't. And um, so Caesar, you know, defeats, you know, the last blue state army. He's sort of the red state army. And then he defeats Cato and Cato does this thing. Bernie Sanders would never do this. Uh, he commits harakiri. He actually cuts his belly open with a fucking sword. Wow. And dies. Yeah. Right. Incredibly based. Right. So you have to respect Cato. But, you know, here's the thing. In Cato's tent, which Caesar captures, is a big chest of letters from back home. And the thing is, knowing about this proscription thing, knowing about this proscription thing, you're like, imagine you're like a rich guy in Rome. You're not rich, but imagine you were rich. You're in Rome and you want to like protect your like villa. Frankly, you got a pretty nice villa. Right. Uh, you know, one thing that you might think of doing is writing a letter 
to both sides. Yeah. And being like, hey, you know, yeah. my friend Cato, you know, I love your policies. Right. You know, your faith in the old republic is right. like, you know, and then you would be like, hey, Caesar, Caesar, you know, you're your new, new ways, right, you know, yeah. right. You know, and then, you know, the problem is that basically if Cato's tent gets captured, right, there's your letter. <laughs> Right. Caesar's like, you know, <laughs> right. You know, Both, yeah. I'm not feeling too good about you right now. Right. And so Caesar's guys, you know, being very practical individuals are like, this is amazing. What do we do? Let's how do we, you know, do we start with A? Do we start with Z? Like, what do we do with these guys? And Caesar being an imaginative strategic visionary whose name would be a synonym for the word king for um, the next uh, 2,000 years plus um, is like, oh, here's what you do. Take this chest, put it on a bunch of um, logs of wood, pour olive oil all over it, and set it on fire. Yeah. And these guys are like, what the fuck? And Caesar's like, you don't fucking get it. We fucking won. Right. They're all our people now. Right. And so, you know, it's sort of Caesar's like genius in saying that basically, He's the monarch of like all the fucking people. Right. Is like, you know, and here's what happens. And, you know, Caesar, you know, if you do this, like Caesar could have taken a little more care with his personal security. Okay. So if you're out there right. listening, you know, you're probably the next American Caesar. Like, you know, don't mess with that stuff. All of my right. audience is little you know, Caesars. All, you know, they're yeah. all little they're Caesars. Eating little they're, Caesars. Re they're eating it right now. Yeah. You know, I, you know, so <laughs> if you're going to do this, like, you know, <sighs> Yeah. You know, just like be sensible, yeah. you know, um, um, you know, but Caesar was amazing, but his nephew Octavian, who becomes Augustus, the next Caesar, also amazing, basically follows Caesar's position. The whole conflict of the orders, red state versus blue state, never heard from again. It disappears. Imagine an America in which the red versus blue, like distinction doesn't matter. Neither side, you know, most people, when they vote in elections today, they have a single reason for why they want to vote. It's like fucking Persians versus right. Italians. The Persians vote because they want to defend themselves against the Italians. The Italians vote because basically they're like, these Persian motherfuckers are going to do to us what, what we did to Valerian. Right. Beyond that, nobody's like, it's not Norman Rockwell. No one's like, oh, we need to guide. Here are my ideas about nuclear policy. That like, fuck that. That's all right. gone. It's just self-defense out there. And so if you can get to a point where the self-defense is no longer needed, you should really be comfortable saying, I'm not going to engage in this ridiculous spectacle again. That is the way the Romans felt after a few years of the early Roman Empire. The last Roman Empire that actually tried to hold, hold like elections in the street, like where people could like vote. Yeah. Caligula and it was a fucking joke and everybody right. knew it was a joke and nobody tried it again thereafter. And so, you know, basically you know, that's sort of the way that politics ends. The way that politics ends is basically people are like, this is just a system. The system of the conflict of the orders created Caesar. Caesar couldn't come out any other way than through the Civil War. The next Caesar will somehow come out of the next president who's an FDR, who's a Kennedy, will somehow come out of an American election. That's the only way you get to be president. Right. Right. Um, and they will just be like, you know what? I just got elected president. It says in the constitution, I just read the con, I read it. I read it on the bathroom. I read it a couple of times. I had one of those really long, difficult shits. So I read it over again. Um, it says that the president is a chief executive of the executive branch. To my mind, that's pretty clear. Um, it says the Supreme Court can write opinions and Congress can pass laws. And um, it is the president's, um, you know, understanding that he's here to execute the supreme law of the land. Um, I, as president, not I, of course, but I, as president, will um, treat the opinions and the laws passed by Congress with as much respect as they deserve. There's a great deal of expertise there. Um, right. I'll listen with great interest. Um, I am now, um, so what I'm now, I'm yeah. now sending the secret service to the fed. They're taking over the fed. We're going to fund an entirely new government directly from the fed and the power of the purse, which is, um, and is that constitutional? Yes. It's completely sure. constitutional. Right. In fact, you would describe this new monarchical presidency as a constitutional presidency. And then, it's actually yeah. a restoration of the real constitution to put the chief executive then, in charge of the but executive then all branch. the, all the guys at Bohemian Grove kill you. 
We're yeah, trying, unless you have some of the money Okay, to okay, let's go into that. Yeah. Let's go into that. Let's First go into of all, it. it's not the guys in Bohemian Grove. Maybe not. Access. It's more the guys at the New York Times. Yeah. It's the guys at Harvard. It's the guys. Yeah, but aren't like, they at the Bohemian Grove? Yeah, those are like old, rich people who don't matter. You know, like they're not, you know, yeah, you, so you're they got there maybe yeah. by mattering at a certain level, we're but they're not the C- nexus. CIA, we're they're not the like nexus. That, yeah. We're not even, you know, it's just George. If you go back to Kennedy, Kennedy wanted to govern like a monarch. Yeah, right? Kennedy, Kennedy, and, and he kind of did to some extent. He, he did to it's an like, extent. But it's like the successors of like the Georgetown like world. Right. But right. so Kennedy, they take Kennedy out. In any case, and yeah, sure. And Nixon's I don't, removed. I don't fucking know what happens with Kennedy. Okay, let's okay, just guess. Like I'm a Kennedy agnostic. Let's just guess he's taken out. I'm a Kennedy agnostic. In any case, we have this yeah. deep state. So yeah. basically, you have a new president who comes in. Yeah. This is the now we, we got out of the past. We spent a while talking about the past. Yeah. Actually, let me talk a little bit more about the past. Okay. Um, um, most people don't know the name of Pompey, P O M P E Y. Uh, Pompey was called Pompey the Great. He was kind of a proto Caesar in some ways. The reason they called him Pompey the Great is that he solved the big problem that Rome had, which was a problem with pirates. Right. Uh, Rome in basically his day was, it was like Mexico with fucking drug lords. You had these like pirate organizations, pirate armies, pirate kingdoms, whatever. And Rome gets all of its like food from, you know, it's starting to get more and more, at least at the time of its food from North Africa. It's got to get there over the sea. Right. Pirates can just rob that shit and they do. And it's becoming a problem. And the way that the Republic deals with pirates is just not fucking working. It's like the way that like Mexico deals with drug lords, whatever they're doing, Right. It's not working. Right. You know, um, and so, but Rome basically has two forms of like governance. It has the civilian Republican way of doing things, which is basically like a lot of people with names like Biggest Dickus writing letters to right. each other. And it has the military way of doing things. Right. And the military way of doing things has like been like testing its ass against the Gauls, you know, for the last like 50 years. Right. And is just like ruthlessly, completely effective. It basically is like comparing Tesla to the Department of Energy. Right. Or, you know, maybe SpaceX right. to the United Launch Alliance, which is a good comparison because like the United Launch Alliance right. is like private companies too, uh, but right. they're not run like a startup, whereas SpaceX is. And SpaceX is just like, we can do amazing shit for like 1 20th of the money. Right. You know, 20 times faster. And so, the same thing happens. And, you know, the, one of the key, key fun examples of this is remember the Obama healthcare signup site? Yes. Where they were like, they tried to do it the DC way and they spent $500 million or something and like nothing worked. And then they right. got a bunch of people go in, come in and do it the Silicon Valley way. Yeah. And they like finished it in a month in like, you know, for like, you know, 75 cents. Right. You know, yeah. it wasn't that they, all these people are progressives, right. You know, there's no fucking Republicans on this team, but they're operating the Silicon Valley way. And the Silicon Valley way is a monarchy. All right. startups are monarchies. All companies are monarchies. You know, if you drive a car, it was built by a monarchy. If you watch a movie, it was directed as a monarchy. If you go to a restaurant, the chef is a monarch. Right. Monarchs are everywhere once you see them. Monarchies are everywhere once you see them because all effective organizations operate as a monarchy. And this was also true of the Roman military structure. And so what they do is they basically take this guy, Pompey, and at the time, Rome was such a healthy place that to be a politician, you had to go and serve in the army. So Paul, Pompey has political ambitions, uh, but he's also a military guy. And um, this is like the destruction of Rome in the late imperial days, the separation between bureaucrats and military guys. Um, and in other words, the State Department versus DOD. Um, and Pompey, basically, they, they take this guy, Pompey, I'm not really sure why they chose him. Um, I'm not an expert, as you can tell. I'm like a generalist. And uh, I don't know why they chose him. The Senate is like, okay, we're going to do this the military way. We're going to say, Pompey, you have absolute command. You have like CEO level control of the whole fucking Mediterranean. Anything that involves the sea, you can do. Get rid of the fucking pirates. Right. And Pompey is like, okay. And without any computers, without any internet, without any telephones, without any typewriters, without any guns, without any of this shit, in three months, he builds a fucking fleet and basically clears the Mediterranean of pirates. Right. And motherfuckers in Rome are just like, fuck. Because what they've seen is that a completely different way of running a railroad works way the fuck better. Right. Than the one that they're all used to. 
that they're all invested in. That's like all basically the normal way of doing so it's and really about the person, right? It's about the, the person and the organizational Caesar, structure. Caesar, when he when he looks at the uh, when he when he says, "Let's burn the letters," they're all yeah. our people. Let's retire. That person these. has to make the right call. Yeah. Caesar had a choice yeah. to be another Marius. He basically was like, "No, I'm going to be purple. Because I'm going to basically govern." Yes. You know, you the said before a monarchy was some form of accountability. Yeah, right. And so that that vague. That was that was something that the Romans never developed, and okay. most systems never. So the accountable monarchy is something that genuinely hasn't been done before. And is In that some your ways, is that your idea, or is your idea the monarchy monarchy or the accountable monarchy? Uh, my idea is like anything but what we have now. It's okay. like first of all, you have to establish. Go back to the basic thing: oligarchy is fucked. Politics is fucked, which means democracy is fucked. Right. You cannot basically, if you like draw a quadrant of like people who believe America is a democracy, people who yeah. believe it should be a democracy, right? I'm in the corner of it's not and it should be. But Hitler be. would be worse than what we have Hitler now. Hitler would be worse. Right. Okay. Right. The thing is, um, you know, the trains would probably, you know, work a little better, but other things would be worse. I don't take Hitler public is, trend, but Hitler yeah, is yeah. like Marius. Right. Hitler is like Marius. He's basically governing from one side. And so Hitler is the enemy of the German intelligentsia which happens to include the German, German Jews. Right. And then because he's a, you know, he's a fucking idiot. He's like the Jews. And it would be hard to have a Trump who's very vain and, 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 and petty and vindictive yeah. because Trump would have been like, give me the letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trump would have been right. like, give me the letters. Trump's not like, let's burn the letters. Trump is like, give me the letters. So, you know, so much Trump of, doesn't yeah. even get the, the point of give me the letters. Because Trump doesn't even yeah, win the war. Your, you know, your but, point is so correct about there is efficiency to a centralized thing, but the person is the, the wild person, card. Yeah. So That's the person, the so basically card. there are two, there are two risks in basically there's just like no alternative. Is besides, Britain still a monarchy? No, no, no. no, no. Right, like right. compare Elizabeth the first to Elizabeth the second. You can't. Right. You know, right. and Elizabeth the first is a real monarch. Elizabeth the second is like a Kardashian with a crown. Right. Right. So, you know, you basically, um, if you basically are like, okay, how do you get the next American monarch? First of all, like, the only way that isn't totally fucking scary is like electing a constitutional president and having this president basically rebuild the executive branch from scratch. Right. There was a, some recent writing about this plan that some like Trump associates have right. of like maybe if we can like fire bureaucrats, it'll never work. And I'll tell you why. Both of my, by the way, my parents and my stepfather all worked in like the deep state for a total of like 80 years. Right. The, the reason why is that if you're used to operating in the, in the private sector, you, you're used to an org chart which runs from the top down. So it's like in like, you know, uh, like the platonic ideal of a big company that's run from the top down would be any company run by Elon Musk. And like, you know, it doesn't matter what the engine engineers fuel, the engine engineers, it's like SpaceX think that like, you know, um, the rocket should use. They could think it should use hydrazine. Elon thinks it should use methane. Elon, Elon wins. Right. right. It's a real fucking monarchy. It operates from the top down. Um, when something becomes a bureaucracy, and by the way, government organizations can operate this way. The Manhattan Project ran the same fucking way as SpaceX. Right. Right. Government organization. United Launch Alliance works the same way as the Department of Energy. Private company. Right. right? You know, and so when you're a bureaucracy, Everyone's job is a process. When you go to work as like the most junior employee of the State Department, your job is not to get something done. Your job is to go through a process. Um, you have a boss. The reason you have a boss is not that your boss has like a higher level mission to accomplish. Oh, no. Your boss is basically who you kept kick exceptions up to. If the process doesn't handle something, it has what we call in computer science an exception. Your boss has a decision to make. If it doesn't fit inside his process, which is broader, he kicks it up. Eventually, it will land on the desk of the president. Right. Who is making decisions all day long. But if you replace the White House with a magic eight ball, like no American would notice the difference. Right. Right. It's just like, you know. So um, it's rebuilding an executive branch. Right. So what FDR did to solve this problem, FDR was already, uh, you know, the executive branch at its time was much, much smaller and much, much more elite and much, much more somewhat top-down, he went around it. He created all these alphabet soup agencies. He created right. new agencies, and it took him a lot of time to take over, like, the Army right. and the State Department. He you had know. four terms. 
Yeah, right, right. You know, well, three in a three in a little bit. Three right? in a little bit. Um, yeah. And um, but he was going to rule for life, right? You know, that's another thing that you see with monarchs. The only right. one who actually retires is Washington. And um, you know, the um, you and, think Lincoln would have been forever? Who the fuck knows? Perhaps. Yeah, um, who and knows? Uh, there was certainly no law barring him. Uh, you know, and people passed that law after that amendment, yeah, twenty fifth or for whatever after FDR uh, kicks it, right? And um, so. Basically, the idea that like, oh, what's wrong with this organization is that it doesn't listen to the president is sort of true enough, but it doesn't capture the sort of real need to like completely restructure these organizations. If you look at, for example, state, the State Department's 30,000 employees is some of the most elite people in the world. It's hard to get those jobs. Uh, you have to pass. It's one of the last, you know, one of the great reforms yeah. that created the deep state was like competitive examinations for like government offices, right? That created the meritocracy. Carter did away with most of them in 1980. And um, the rest are sort of being done away with now. When people hear this and say, uh, when you say run like Tesla company, it yeah. sounds... What is the difference between your ideal version of a monarchy and a fascist state? Um, the ideal, the difference between the ideal version of the monarchy and the fascist state is two things. One is that fascism is, again, like Marius and Sulla. Fascism basically is sort of an imperfect monarchy and that it's sort of the victory of kind of one faction in a civil war. The fascists who sort of came to power, whether they're in Italy, Spain, Germany or whatever, are sort of always coming to power against the like Mariuses of their day. Right. They're always, you know, they're virulent and they're fighting against like virulent Bolshevism that right. does like and sort of neither of those things exist today, which is sort of very, very good. Like people like compare, oh, there was street violence in 2016 and also in like, you know, 1932. I'm like, in 1932, like five people a day are getting stabbed to death in Berlin, right? You know, and like the, right. the communists are giving as good as they get, right. right? You know, it's just crazy. And so you have all of this at that, in that era, you have all of this kind of locked up potential for violence in the society because it's full of people who've gone through World War fucking one. Right. Right. You know, these people would just like kill you as soon as look at you after you've been in the trenches yeah. for like a fucking week. You have no respect for life. Is there so a country? That's part of, yeah. That's, is there, is that's, there a country where you see an example of this? A kind better of, example. Yeah. So a better, you know, Singapore is right. a good example of like, you know, Singapore is a multi-ethnic country. Right. It has it doesn't have Persians and I Italians, but it has Asian. It has Indians and Chinese. Um, and, um, you know, basically, uh, actually, Lee Kuan Yew comes to power. You know, the, the Caesar of Singapore comes to power in a very similar way as the original Caesar. The ruling party of Singapore is still called the People's Action Party. It was like this, like violent, anti-colonialist, basically quasi-communist party. And basically it puts forth this guy, Lee Kuan Yew, who becomes like establishes like William Gibson famously called Singapore Disneyland with the death penalty. Right. Um, you know, I like the Disneyland part. Um, you know, there are definitely ways in which Singapore could be like more fun, but you can certainly right. walk around in any part of Singapore at any time of day or night. Try that in LA, you know, and right. um, yeah. don't actually, but yeah. um, the for kids out there, certainly don't, don't try, try this in, at home. Don't try right. in San Francisco. <laughs> don't yeah. try it in San Francisco either. Um, you know, you might be able to get away in it with it in Kano. Right, you know, and yeah. um, the right um, in any case, got to do this callbacks. Do you and, think that? Uh, so, to, yeah. can I let Singapore. me finish answering yes. your question yes. for a second? So, that sense of basically, like, I'm courage, sort of all the libs and even the cons out there, like, you know, conservatives kind of love FDR, right? You know, conservatives love the Kennedys, right? Don't think in terms of Hitler. Think about FDR and the Kennedys. Right. That's your sort of first point. Like basically, and, 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 you know, if you have to choose, honestly, if you have to choose between a dictator who's on the side of the aristocracy and a dictator who's on the side of the middle classes, it's a really fucking hard choice. But I, as a born aristocrat, I'm going to choose the blue Caesar just because, um, you know, when a populist movement becomes anti aristocratic, People are really right to notice that like Trump's voter base is the same as Hitler's voter base, right? You know, they're right. really correct to notice that the we way just that lost this their, I like how we've 
We've oscillated. Yeah, I'm just making like, so many different people. I'm, losing, this I'm losing the red people. No, I love yeah, it. Yeah, I yeah. love I it. Mean, that's I try to fact. do this. As, I'm sorry. Yeah, I try to do it's this just on a fact. Stage. It's yeah. just a fact, right? It doesn't mean that Trump is Hitler, right? Yeah. You know, Hitler would fucking laugh at Trump, right? You know, right? Uh, and and the um um, you know um. So I, are you all in for DeSantis then? Because he's Yale. You know, I can't. Florida's fun. He's so, you know, it has problems. The thing that's the thing that's nice about the thing that I really love about Trump yes. is that he breaks the frame. I don't sort of feel DeSantis like no, breaking DeSantis the frame. No, DeSantis has no interest in breaking the frame. Yeah, and He's I and that's why I, and, and I can't get hot on for him. You know, right. I mean, you know, and and so that's the sort of the the genius and the A lot of the guys of that you advise their campaigns or unofficially because I don't know what you do, but a lot I of am not I have no role like right. I'm not a player. Right. Okay, so 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 but people listen to you. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, you know, um, you know, the, um, um, they, just, but it really mostly just cause I'm funny, you know, and, sure. and in what do you case, think a guy like Peter Thiel's interest in politics is? Do you think he's a, is it from a business perspective? No, is it from no, a, absolutely not. not. Absolutely not. From a social absolutely perspective. Not, absolutely not. Um, you know, and, and this is true of almost like, there's no one who wants everyone's interest, whether you're George Soros or Peter Thiel is not from a mercenary perspective. Right. Like, you know, once you have billions of dollars, like another billion or two, who cares? doesn't fucking right. matter. Like, you right. know, the only thing that you can buy with your money at that level is power. And the only That's thing that you're want. interested in using power for is to make a world that you believe in. Most, all of these people are completely fucking sincere. You right. know, and um, and it really and that's the scary. Thing. That's the scary thing. That's right. Right. You know, and basically yeah. <laughs> they're all completely fucking sincere, you know. Right. And, and so, you know, when you get to basically sort of constructing your kind of new monarchy, the first question, you've got three questions. Number one, is this person capable? You know, which unfortunately in the case of Trump is a no. Again, right. he, he's just, he's not, he's under promoted. It's like the opposite of like Parkinson's law or the Peter principle. Right. Like he needs to, he needs to realize that he's a great American. Donald, if you're out here listening, you're, you're a great American. You should, you should run in 2024. You should win. You should become the chairman of the board and you should hire right. a chief of staff. You should be like George Washington. Right. You should hire a chief of staff who's like Alexander Hamilton and basically do a lot of photo ops, play a lot of golf, say a lot of funny things on TV and on Twitter. Um, you know, obviously they'll give it back to you. Right. Um, and um, that's what you should do. You should be you. Don't try to be something else. Don't try to be Alexander Hamilton. Don't assume that your fucking son-in-law is Alexander fucking Hamilton. He's not. Get Elon Musk. You know, Do you really think Elon Musk would be this guy? He might, he like, I, he could. You know, you don't have to be an American. You know, Elon, okay, he's an African American. You know, but the thing is that, like, you yes. don't. You don't. My have, worry about him is he seem he loves the limelight. He's a little, yeah. He loves little, the limelight too little much. much. He's a little kind much. of fond of the ladies. He loves the limelight a little much. Yeah. You know, basically, okay, get Elon Musk, but twenty years younger. You okay. know, get the guy who's going to be Elon Musk that nobody's heard of. Easy to find. You when could you, probably yeah. ask Elon Musk and he'd tell you. When I was is. doing shows, final question. When I was doing shows in Palo Alto, I was in San Jose and I'm walking around Palo Alto. If I'm walking around with you, is it like. You are, could throw a stone and yeah. hit a fucking person who could do this fucking job. Yeah. But, I could buy, you know, I couldn't give you a list of a hundred people. I could email you like 10 people and get a list of a hundred people who could do this. Yeah, but job. how, how. When you were in those in those in the old world, your old yeah. tech yeah. world, yeah. Um, is it a friendly reception? Is it like uh, is it like a mystique? Is it like that's great as you are? And how how uh, is you know it? honestly know. one of the things that I try to do as yeah. a writer uh, that I recommend to anyone who's in the entertainment industry is to basically not consume any content that's about myself. Right. So that's I a good idea. Have, I actually have, there was this like Vanity Fair article yes. on the new right. I uh, haven't read it. Right. Jeff Bezos like tweeted it. I haven't read it. Right. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to read it. Sorry, James. Uh, you know, and, yeah. and, and like the, uh, like, um, um, you know, yeah. Like, so actually I kind of don't know and I kind of don't care. You know, the reason I started blogging back in 2007 was like, this is what I believe. I don't care what other people believe. This is what right. I believe to be true. I probably made some mistakes. Um, I think, you know, I'm famous for being a little too like COVID crackdown happy. I'm convinced that this is because I was betting on COVID. Um, and, you know, so I've made my errors, you know, over time. That's one of them. 
Um, but yeah, the the like the approach of just saying what I believe is just one that I recommend to everyone. But like before even even like before you like read my shit, like you know, just like do that thing I I talked about with the Islanders. Yeah, like basically stop being a sports fan. Right. Like it's like sports fan politics. Yes. It's just like it's pornography. That's right. It's fucking the pornography well, of power. Yes. If you want real, you know, if you want real sex, give up porn. That's right. Start That's by giving idea. up porn. Yes. I'm completely serious about this. That's and, yeah. and if you want real power, power that matters, power that like, you know, makes this country like what it should be for like fucking red state and you know blue state and black and white and green and purple and all fucking people in this country including even the fucking zombies down on skid row if you want to basically make this the country that this should be for everyone just like turn off your fucking politics turn off the culture war and basically just start thinking about how the fucking government should work i got two words for you before we get out of here and you don't even have to respond but in my head after everything you've just said I got to be honest with you. I think we could do a lot worse. Caitlin Jenner. Yeah! <laughs> Curtis Norman, thank you very much. Thank you. What was uh, Substack? Graymirror.substack.com. Gray, That's gray with an A, the American way. Gray Mirror. Curtis Norman, thank you so much. We really appreciate thank you coming on. Thank you so on. much. Thank you, brother. Huge, huge pleasure, Tim. Thank you, buddy.